section twenty four of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the vale of tears eighteen ninety to nineteen ten part two four mob violence election troubles the atlanta massacre after two or three years of comparative quiet but only comparative quiet mob violence burst forth about the turn of the century with redoubled intensity in a large way this was simply a result of the campaigns for disfranchisement that in some of the southern states were just now getting under way but charges of assault and questions of labor also played a part in some places people who were innocent of any charge whatever were attacked and so many were killed that sometimes it seemed that the law had broken down altogether not the least interesting development of these troublous years was that in some cases as never before negroes began to fight with their backs to the wall and thus at the very close of the century at the end of a bitter decade and the beginning of one still more bitter a new factor entered into the problem one that was destined more and more to demand consideration on one sunday toward the close of october eighteen ninety eight the country recorded two race wars one lynching two murders one of which was expected to lead to a lynching with a total of ten negroes killed and four wounded and four white men killed and seven wounded the most serious outbreak was in the state of mississippi and it is worthy of note that in not one single case was there any question of rape november was made red by election troubles in both north and south carolina in the latter state at phoenix and greenwood county on november eight and for some days thereafter the tolberts a well-known family of white republicans were attacked by mobs and barely escaped alive r r tolbert was a candidate for congress and also chairman of the republican state committee john r tolbert his father collector of the port of charleston had come home to vote and was at one of the polling places in the county thomas tolbert at phoenix was taking the affidavits of the negroes who were not permitted to vote for his brother in order that later there might be ground on which to contest the election while thus engaged he was attacked by etheridge the democratic manager of another precinct the negroes came to tobert's defense and in the fight that followed etheridge was killed and tobert wounded john tobert coming up was filled with buckshot and a younger member of the family was also hurt the negroes were at length overpowered and the tobert's forced to flee all told it appears that two white men and about twelve negroes lost their lives in connection with the trouble six of the latter being lynched on account of the death of etheridge in north carolina in eighteen ninety four the republicans by combining with the populists have secured control of the state legislature in eighteen ninety six the democrats were again outvoted governor russell being elected by a plurality of nine thousand a considerable number of local offices was in the hands of negroes who had the backing of the governor the legislature and the supreme court as well before the november elections in eighteen ninety eight the democrats in wilmington announced their determination to prevent negroes from holding office in the city especially had they been made angry by an editorial in a local negro paper the record in which under date august eighteen the editor alex l manley starting with a reference to a speaker from georgia who at the agricultural society meeting at tybee had advocated lynching as an extreme measure said that she lost sight of the basic principle of the religion of christ in her plea for one class of people as against another and continued the papers are filled with reports of rapes of white women and the subsequent lynching of the alleged rapists the editors pour forth volleys of aspersions against all negroes because of the few who may be guilty if the papers and speakers of the other race would condemn the commission of crime because it is crime and not try to make it appear that the negroes were the only criminals they would find their strongest allies in the intelligent negroes themselves and together the whites and blacks would root the evil out of both races our experience among poor white people in the country teaches us that the women of that race are not any more particular in the matter of clandestine meetings with colored men than are the white men with colored women meetings of this kind go on for some time until the woman's infatuation or the man's boldness brings attention to them and the man is lynched for rape in reply to this the speaker quoted in a signed statement said 
when the negro manly attributed the crime of rape to intimacy between negro men and white women of the south the slanderer should be made to fear a lyncher's rope rather than occupy a place in new york newspapers a method of argument that was unfortunately all too common in the south as election day approached the democrats sought generally to intimidate the negroes the streets and roads being patrolled by men wearing red shirts election day however passed without any disturbance but on the next day there was a mass meeting of white citizens at which there were adopted resolutions to employ white labor instead of negro to banish the editor of the record and to send away from the city the printing press in the office of that paper and a committee of twenty-five was appointed to see that these resolutions were carried into effect within twenty-four hours in the course of the terrible day that followed the printing office was destroyed several white republicans were driven from the city and nine negroes were killed at once though no one could say with accuracy just how many more lost their lives or were seriously wounded before that trouble was over charles w chestnut in the marrow of tradition has given a faithful portrayal of these disgraceful events the wellington of the story being wilmington perhaps the best commentary on those who thus sought power was afforded by their apologist a presbyterian minister and editor a j McElway, who on this occasion and others wrote articles in the independent and the outlook justifying the proceedings said he it is difficult to speak of the red shirts without a smile they victimized the negroes with a huge practical joke a dozen men would meet at a cross-road on horseback clad in red shirts or calico flannel or silk according to the taste of the owner and the enthusiasm of his womankind they would gallop through the country and the negro would quietly make up his mind that his interest in political affairs was not a large one anyhow he would be wise not to vote and wiser not to register to prevent being dragooned into voting on election day it thus appears that the forcible seizure of the political rights of people the killing and wounding of many and the compelling of scores to leave their homes amount in the end to not more than a practical joke one part of the new program was the most intense opposition to federal negro appointees anywhere in the south on the morning of february twenty two eighteen ninety eight fraser b baker the colored postmaster of lake city south carolina awoke to find his house in flames attempting to escape he and his baby boy were shot and killed and their bodies consumed in the burning house his wife and the other children were wounded but escaped the postmaster general was quite disposed to see that justice was done in this case but the men charged with the crime gave the most trivial alibis and on saturday april twenty two eighteen ninety nine the jury in the united states circuit court at charleston reported its failure to agree on a verdict three years later the whole problem was presented strongly to president roosevelt when mrs minnie cox who was serving efficiently as postmistress at indianola mississippi was forced to resign because of threats he closed the office and when there was protest against the appointment of dr william d crum as collector of the port of charleston he said i do not intend to appoint any unfit man to office so far as i legitimately can i shall always endeavor to pay regard to the wishes and feelings of the people of each locality but i cannot consent to take the position that the door of hope the door of opportunity is to be shut upon any man no matter how worthy purely upon the grounds of race or color such an attitude would according to my convictions be fundamentally wrong these memorable words coming in a day of compromise and expediency in high places greatly cheered the heart of the race just the year before the importance of the incident of booker t washington's taking lunch with president roosevelt was rather unnecessarily magnified by the south into all sorts of discussion of social equality on tuesday january twenty fourth eighteen ninety nine a fire in the centre of the town of palmetto georgia destroyed a hotel two stores and a storehouse on which property there was little insurance the next saturday there was another fire and this destroyed a considerable part of the town for some weeks there was no clue as to the origin of these fires but about the middle of march something overheard by a white citizen led to the implicating of nine negroes these men were arrested and confined for the night of march fifteen in a warehouse to await trial the next morning a dummy guard of six men being placed before the door about midnight a mob came pushed open the door and fired two volleys at the negroes killing four immediately and fatally wounding four more the circumstances of this atrocious crime oppressed the negro people of the state as few things had done since the civil war that it did no good was evident for in its underlying psychology it was closely associated with a double crime that was now to be committed 
in april sam hose a negro who had brooded on the happenings at palmetto not many miles from the scene killed a farmer alfred cranford who had been a leader of the mob and outraged his wife for two weeks he was hunted like an animal the white people of the state meanwhile being almost unnerved and the negroes sickened by the pursuit at last however he was found and on sunday april twenty three at noonan georgia he was burned his execution being accompanied by unspeakable mutilation and on the same day liege strickland a negro preacher whom hose had accused of complicity in his crime was hanged near palmetto the nation stood aghast for the recent events in georgia had shaken the very foundations of american civilization said the charleston news and courier the chains which bound the citizen sam hose to the stake at noon mean more for us and for his race than the chains or bonds of slavery which they supplanted the flames that lit the scene of his torture shed their baleful light throughout every corner of our land and exposed the state of things actual and potential among us that should rouse the dullest mind to a sharp sense of our true condition and of our unchanged and unchangeable relations to the whole race whom the tortured wretch represented violence breeds violence and two or three outstanding events are yet to be recorded on august twenty three eighteen ninety nine at darien georgia hundreds of negroes who for days had been aroused by rumors of a threatened lynching assembled at the ring of the bell of a church opposite the jail and by their presence prevented the removal of a prisoner they were later tried for insurrection and twenty-one sent to the convict farms for a year the general circumstances of the uprising excited great interest throughout the country in may nineteen hundred in augusta georgia an unfortunate streetcar incident resulted in the death of the aggressor a young white man named whitney and in the lynching of the colored man wilson who killed him in this instance the victim was tortured and mutilated parts of his body and of the rope by which he was hanged being passed around as souvenirs a negro organization at length recovered the body and so great was the excitement at the funeral that the coffin was not allowed to be opened two months later in new orleans there was a most extraordinary occurrence the same being important because the leading figure was very frankly regarded by the negroes as a hero in his fight in his own defence a sign that the men of the race would not always be shot down without some effort to protect themselves one night in july an hour before midnight two negroes robert charles and leonard pierce who had recently come into the city from mississippi and whose movements had interested the police were found by three officers on the front steps of a house in dry aids street being questioned they replied that they had been in the town two or three days and had secured work in the course of the questioning the larger of the negroes charles rose to his feet he was seized by one of the officers mora who began to use his billet and in the struggle that resulted charles escaped and mora was wounded in each hand in the hip charles now took refuge in a small house on fourth street and when he was surrounded with deadly aim he shot and instantly killed the first two officers who appeared the other men advancing retreated and waited until daylight for reinforcement and charles himself withdrew to other quarters and for some days his whereabouts were unknown with the new day however the city was wild with excitement and thousands of men joined in the search the newspapers all the while stirring the crowd to greater fury mobs rushed up and down the streets assaulting negroes wherever they could be found no effort to check them being made by the police on the second night a crowd of nearly a thousand was addressed at the lee monument by a man from kenner a town a few miles above the city said he gentlemen i am from kenner and i have come down here to-night to assist you in teaching the blacks a lesson i have killed a negro before in revenge of the wrong wrought upon you and yours i am willing to kill again the only way you can teach these niggers a lesson and put them in their place is to go out and lynch a few of them as an object lesson string up a few of them that is the only thing to do kill them string them up lynch them i will lead you on to the parish prison and lynch pierce the mob now rushed to the prison stores and pawn shops being plundered on the way within the next few hours a negro was taken from a street car on canal street killed and his body thrown into the gutter an old man of seventy going to work in the morning was fatally shot on rousseau street the mob fired into a little cabin the inmates were asleep and an old woman was killed in bed another old woman who looked out from her home was beaten into insensibility a man sitting at his door was shot beaten and left for dead such were the scenes that were enacted almost hourly from monday until friday evening one night the excellent school building given by thorny lafon a member of the race and a philanthropist was burned about three o'clock on friday afternoon charles was found to be in a two-story house at the corner of saratoga and cleo streets two officers portius and lowley 
entered a lower room the first fell dead at the first shot and the second was mortally wounded by the next a third bloomfield waiting with gun in hand was wounded at the first shot and killed at the second the crowd retreated but bullets rained upon the house charles all the while keeping watch in every direction from four different windows every now and then he thrust his rifle through one of the shattered window panes and fired working with incredible rapidity he succeeded in killing two more of his assailants and wounding two at last he realized that the house was on fire and knowing that the end had come he rushed forth upon his foes fired one shot more and fell dead he had killed eight men and mortally wounded two or three more his body was mutilated in his room there was afterwards found a copy of a religious publication and it was shown that he had resented disfranchisement in louisiana and had distributed pamphlets to further a colonization scheme no incriminating evidence however was found in the same memorable year nineteen hundred on the night of wednesday august fifteenth there were serious riots in the city of new york on the preceding sunday a policeman named thorpe in attempting to arrest a colored woman was stabbed by a negro arthur harris so fatally that he died on monday on wednesday evening negroes were dragged from the street cars and beaten and by midnight there were thousands of rioters between twenty fifth and thirty fifth streets on the next night the trouble was resumed these events were followed almost immediately by riots in akron ohio on the last sunday in october nineteen o one while some negroes were holding their usual fall camp meeting in a grove in washington parish louisiana they were attacked and a number of people not less than ten or perhaps several more were killed and hundreds of men women and children felt forced to move away from the vicinity in the first week of march nineteen o four there was in mississippi a lynching that exceeded even others of the period in its horror and that became notorious for its use of a corkscrew a white planter of doddsville was murdered and a negro luther hobart was charged with the crime hobart fled and his innocent wife went with him further report we read in the democratic evening post of vicksburg as follows when the two negroes were captured they were tied to trees and while the funeral pyres were being prepared they were forced to suffer the most fiendish tortures the blacks were forced to hold out their hands while one finger at a time was chopped off the fingers were distributed as souvenirs the ears of the murderers were cut off hobart was beaten severely his skull was fractured and one of his eyes knocked out with a stick hung by a shred from the socket the most excruciating form of punishment consisted in the use of a large corkscrew in the hands of some of the mob this instrument was bored into the flesh of the man and the woman in the arms legs and body and then pulled out the spirals tearing out big pieces of raw quivering flesh every time it was withdrawn in the summer of this same year georgia was once more the scene of a horrible lynching two negroes paul reed and will cater because of the murder of the hodges family six miles from the town on july twenty being burned at the stake at statesville under unusually depressing circumstances in august nineteen o eight there were in springfield illinois race riots of such a serious nature that a force of six thousand soldiers was required to quell them these riots were significant not only because of the attitude of northern laborers toward negro competition but also because of the indiscriminate killing of negroes by people in the north this indicating a genuine nationalization of the negro problem the real climax of violence within the period however was the atlanta massacre of saturday september twenty two nineteen o six throughout the summer the heated campaign of hoke smith for the governorship capitalized the gathering sentiment for the disfranchisement of the negro in the state and at length raised the race issue to such a high pitch that it leaped into flame the feeling was intensified by the report of assaults and attempted assaults by negroes particularly as these were detailed and magnified or even invented by an evening paper the atlanta news against which the fulton county grand jury afterwards brought in an indictment as largely responsible for the riot and which was forced to suspend publication when the businessmen of the city withdrew their support just how much foundation there was to the rumors may be seen from the following report of the investigator three charged two white men attracted comparatively little attention in the newspapers although one the offense of a man named tonnage was shocking in its details of twelve such charges against negroes in the six months preceding the riot two were cases of rape horrible in their details three were aggravated attempts at rape three may have been attempts three were pure cases of fright on the part of white women and in one the white woman first asserting that a negro had assaulted her finally confessed attempted suicide on friday september twenty one while a negro was on trial the father of the girl concerned asked the recorder for permission to deal with the negro with his own hand and an outbreak was barely averted in the open court on saturday evening however some elements in the city 
and from neighbouring towns heated by liquor and newspaper extras became openly riotous and until midnight defied all law and authority negroes were assaulted wherever they appeared for the most part being found unsuspecting as in the case of those who happened to be going home from work and were on street cars passing through the heart of the city in one barber shop two workers were beaten to death and their bodies mangled a lame bootblack innocent and industrious was dragged from his work and kicked and beaten to death another young negro was stabbed with jack-knives altogether very nearly a score of persons lost their lives and two or three times as many were injured after some time governor terrell mobilized the militia but the crowd did not take this move seriously and the real feeling of the mayor who turned down the hose of the fire department was shown by a statement that just so long as the negroes committed certain crimes just so long would they be unceremoniously dealt with sunday dawned upon a city of astounded white people and outraged and sullen negroes throughout monday and tuesday the tension continued the negroes endeavoring to defend themselves as well as they could on monday night the union of some citizens with policemen who were advancing in a suburb in which most of the homes were those of negroes resulted in the death of james hurd an officer and in the wounding of some of those who accompanied him more negroes were also killed in a white woman two front porch two men were chased died of fright at seeing them shot to death it was the disposition however on the part of the negroes to make armed resistance that really put an end to the massacre now followed a procedure that is best described in the words of the prominent apologist for such outbreaks said a j mcelway tuesday every house in the town that is the suburb referred to above was entered by the soldiers at some two hundred and fifty negroes temporarily held while the search was proceeding and inquiries being made they were all disarmed and those with concealed weapons or under suspicion of having been in the party firing on the police were sent to jail it is thus evident that in this case as in many others the negroes who had suffered most not the white men who killed a score of them were disarmed and that for the time being their terrified women and children were left defenseless mckelway also says in this general connection any southern man would protect an innocent negro who appealed to him for help with his own life if necessary this sounds like chivalry but it is really the survival of the old slavery attitude that begs the whole question the negro does not feel that he should ask any other man to protect him he has quite made up his mind that he will defend his own home himself he stands as a man before the bar and the one thing he wants to know is if the law and the courts of america are able to give him justice simple justice nothing more by the question of labor from time to time in connection with cases of violence we have referred to the matter of labor riots such as we have described are primarily social in character the call of race invariably being the final appeal the economic motive has accompanied this however and has been found to be of increasing importance says du bois the fatal campaign in georgia which culminated in the atlanta massacre was an attempt fathered by conscienceless politicians to arouse the prejudices of the rank and file of white laborers and farmers against the growing competition of black men so that black men by law could be forced back to subserviency and serfdom the question was indeed constantly recurrent but even by the end of the period policies had not yet been definitely decided upon and for the time being there were frequent armed clashes between the negro and the white laborer both capital and common sense were making it clear however that the negro was undoubtedly a labor asset and would have to be given place accordingly in march eighteen ninety five there were bloody riots in new orleans these growing out of the fact that white laborers who were beginning to be organized objected to the employment of negro workers by the shipowners for the unloading of vessels when the trouble was at its height volley after volley was poured upon the negroes and in turn two white men were killed and several wounded the commercial bodies of the city met blamed the governor and the mayor for the series of outbreaks and demanded that the outrages cease said they forbearance has ceased to be a virtue we can no longer treat with men who with arms in their hands are shooting down an inoffensive people because they will not think and act with them for these reasons we say to these people that cost what it may we are determined that the commerce of this city must and shall be protected that every man who desires to perform honest labor must and shall be permitted to do so regardless of race color or previous condition about august one of this same year eighteen ninety five there were sharp conflicts between the white and the black miners at birmingham a number being killed on both sides before military authority could intervene three years later moreover the invasion of the north by negro labor had begun and about november seventeen eighteen ninety eight 
there was serious trouble in the mines of panna and verdon illinois in the same month the convention of railroad brotherhoods in norfolk expressed strong hostility to negro labor grand master frank p sergeant of the brotherhood of locomotive firemen saying that one of the chief purposes of the meeting of the brotherhoods was to begin a campaign in advocacy of white supremacy in the railway service this november it would be recalled was the fateful month of the election riots in north and south carolina the people the socialist labor publication commenting upon a negro indignation meeting at cooper union and upon the problem in general said that the negro was essentially a wage slave that it was the capitalism of the north and not humanity that in the first place had demanded the freedom of the slave that in the new day capital demanded the subjugation of the working class negro or otherwise and it blamed the negroes for not seeing the real issues at stake it continued with emphasis it is not the negro that was massacred in the carolinas it was carolina working men carolina wage slaves who happened to be colored men not as negroes must the race rise it is as working men as a branch of the working class that the negro must denounce the carolina felonies only by touching that cord can he denounce to a purpose because only then does he place himself upon that elevation that will enable him to perceive the source of the specified wrong complained of now this point of view was destined more and more to stimulate those interested in the problem whether they accepted it in its entirety or not another opinion very different and also important was that given in eighteen ninety nine by the editor of dixie a magazine published in atlanta and devoted to southern industrial interests said he the manufacturing centre of the united states will one day be located in the south and this will come about strange as it may seem for the reason that the negro is a fixture here organized labor as it exists to-day is a menace to industry the negro stands as a permanent and positive barrier against labor organization in the south so the negro all unwittingly is playing an important part in the drama of southern industrial development his good nature defies the socialist at the time this opinion seemed plausible and yet the very next two decades were to raise the question if it was not founded on fallacious assumptions the real climax of labor trouble as of mob violence within the period came in georgia and in atlanta a city that now assumed outstanding importance as a battleground of the problems of the new south in april nineteen o nine it happened that ten white workers on the georgia railroad who had been placed on the extra list were replaced by negroes at lower wages against this there was violent protest all along the route a little more than a month later the white firemen's union started a strike that was intended to be the beginning of an effort to drive all negro firemen from southern roads and it was soon apparent that the real contest was one occasioned by the progress in the south of organized labor on the one hand and the progress of the negro in efficiency on the other the essential motives that entered into the struggle were in fact the same as those that characterized the trouble in new orleans in eighteen ninety five said e a ball second vice-president of the firemen's union in an address to the public it will be up to you to determine whether the white firemen now employed on the georgia railroad shall be accorded rights and privileges over the negro or whether he shall be placed on the same equality with the negro also it will be for you to determine whether or not white firemen supporting families in and around atlanta on a pay of a dollar seventy five a day shall be compelled to vacate their positions in atlanta joint terminals for negroes who are willing to do the same work for a dollar and twenty five cents some papers like the augusta herald said that it was a mistaken policy to give preference to negroes when white men would ultimately have to be put in charge of trains and engines but others like the baltimore news said if the negro can be driven from one skilled employment he can be driven from another but a country that tries to do it is flying in the face of every economic law and must feel the evil effects of its policy if it could be carried out at any rate feeling ran very high for a whole week about june one there were very few trains between atlanta and augusta and there were some acts of violence but in the face of the capital at stake and the fundamental issues involved it was simply impossible for the railroad to give way the matter was at length referred to a board of arbitration which decided that the georgia railroad was still to employ negroes whenever they were found qualified and that they were to receive the same wages as white workers some thought that this decision would ultimately tell against the negro but such was not the immediate effect at least and to all intents and purposes the white firemen had lost in the strike the whole matter was in fact fundamentally one of the most pathetic that we have had to record humble white workers desirous of improving the 
economic condition of themselves and their families instead of assuming a statesmanlike and truly patriotic attitude toward their problem turned aside into the wilderness of racial hatred and were lost this review naturally prompts reflection as to the whole function of the negro laborer in the south in the first place what is he worth and especially what is worth in honest southern opinion it was said after the civil war that he would not work except under compulsion just how had he come to be regarded in the industry of the new south in eighteen ninety four a number of large employers were asked about this point fifty per cent said that in skilled labor they considered the negro inferior to the white worker forty six per cent said that he was fairly equal and four per cent said that all things considered he was superior as to the common labor fifty four per cent said that he was equal twenty nine per cent superior and seventy per cent inferior to the white worker at the time it appeared that wages paid negroes averaged eighty per cent of those paid white men a similar investigation by the chattanooga tradesmen in nineteen o two brought forth five hundred replies these were summarized as follows we find the negro more useful and skilled in the cotton seed oil mills and the lumber mills the foundries brick kilns mines and blast furnaces he is superior to white labor and possibly superior to any other labor in these establishments but not in the capacity of skilful and ingenious artisans in this opinion it is to be remembered the negro was subjected to a severe test in which nothing whatever was given to him and at least it appears that in many lines of labor he is not less than indispensable to the progress of the south the question then arises just what is the relation that he is finally to sustain to other workingmen it would seem that white worker and black worker would long ago have realized their identity of interest and have come together the unions however have been slow to admit negroes and give them the same footing and backing as white men under the circumstances accordingly there remained nothing else for the negro to do except to work wherever his services were desired and on the best terms that he was able to obtain End of section twenty four Section 25 of A Social History of the American Negro by Benjamin Griffith Brawley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 The Veil of Tears, 1890-1910, Part 3 6. Defamation, Brownsville crime demands justification and it is not surprising that after such violence as that which we have described and after several states had passed disfranchising acts there appeared in the first years of the new century several publications especially defamatory of the race some books unfortunately descended to a coarseness in vilification such as had not been reached since the civil war from a Bible house in St. Louis in 1902 came The Negro, a Beast, or In the Image of God, a book that was destined to have an enormous circulation among the white people of the poorer class in the South, and that, of course, promoted the mob spirit. Contemporary and of the same general tenor were R. W. Schufelt's The Negro and W. B. Smith's The Color Line, while well, a member of the race itself, William Hannibal Thomas, published a book, The American Negro, that was without either faith or ideal, and as a denunciation of the Negro in America, unparalleled in its vindictiveness and exaggeration. In January 1904, the new governor of Mississippi, J. K. Vardaman, in his inaugural address, went to the extreme of voicing the opinion of those who were now contending that the education of the negro was only complicating the problem and intensifying its dangerous features said he of the negro people as a race they are deteriorating morally every day time has demonstrated that they are more criminal as free men than as slaves that they are increasing in criminality with frightful rapidity being one-third more criminal in 1890 than in 1880 a few weeks later bishop brown of arkansas in a widely quoted address contended that the southern negro was going backward both morally and intellectually and could never be expected to take a helpful part in the government and he also justified lynching 
In the same year, one of the more advanced thinkers of the South, Edgar Gardner Murphy, in Problems of the Present South, was not yet quite willing to receive the Negro on the basis of citizenship, and Thomas Nelson Page, who had belittled the Negro in such a collection of stories as In Old Virginia and in such a novel as Red Rock, formally stated his theories in The Negro, the Southerner's Problem. The worst, however, if there could be a worst in such an array, was yet to appear. In 1905, Thomas Dixon added to a series of high-keyed novels, The Klansman, a glorification of the Ku Klux Klan that gave a malignant portrayal of the Negro, and that was of such a quality as to arouse the most intense prejudice and hatred. Within a few months, the work was put on the stage, and again and again it threw audiences into the wildest excitement. The production was to some extent held to blame for the Atlanta massacre. In several cities it was proscribed. In Philadelphia, on October 23, 1906, after the Negro people had made an unavailing protest, 3,000 of them made a demonstration before the Walnut Street Theater, where the performance was given, while the conduct of some within the playhouse almost precipitated a riot. And in this city the play was suppressed the next day. Throughout the South, however, and sometimes elsewhere, it continued to do its deadly work, and it was later to furnish the basis of The Birth of a Nation, an elaborate motion picture of the same general tendency. Still another line of attack was now to attempt to deprive the Negro of any credit for initiative or for any independent achievement whatsoever. In May 1903, Alfred H. Stone contributed to the Atlantic, a paper, The Mulatto in the Negro Problem, which contended at the same time that whatever meritorious work the race had accomplished was due to the infusion of white blood, and that it was the mulatto that was constantly poisoning the mind of the Negro with radical teachings and destructive doctrines. These points found frequent iteration throughout the period, and years afterwards, in 1917, the first found formal statement in the American Journal of Sociology in an article by Edward Byron Reuter, The Superiority of the Mulatto, which the next year was elaborated into a volume, The Mulatto in the United States. To argue the superiority of the mulatto, of course, is simply to argue once more the inferiority of the Negro to the white man. All of this dispraise together presented a formidable case, and one from which the race suffered immeasurably, nor was it entirely offset in the same years by the appearance even of Du Bois's remarkable book, The Souls of Black Folk, or by the several uplift publications of Booker T. Washington. In passing, we wish to refer to three points. One, the effect of education on the Negro, to the matter of the Negro criminal and of mortality, and three, the quality and function of the mulatto. Education could certainly not be blamed for the difficulties of the problem, in the new day, until it had been properly tried. In no one of the southern states within the period did the Negro child receive a fair chance. He was frequently subjected to inferior teaching, dilapidated accommodations, and short terms. In the representative city of Atlanta, in 1903, the white school population numbered 14,465, and the colored 8,118. The Negroes, however, while numbering 35% of the whole, received but 12% of the school funds. The average white teacher received $745 a year, and the Negro teacher $450. In the great reduction of the percentage of illiteracy in the race from 70 in 1880 to 30.4 in 1910, the missionary colleges, those of the American Missionary Association, the American Baptist Home Mission Society and the Freedmen's Aid Society played a much larger part than they are ordinarily given credit for, and it is a very, very rare occurrence that a graduate of one of the institutions sustained by these agencies or even one who has attended them for any length of time has to be summoned before the courts. Their influence has most decidedly been on the side of law and order. 
undoubtedly some of those who have gone forth from these schools have not been very practical and some have not gained a very firm sense of relative values in life it would be a miracle if all had but as a group the young people who have attended the colleges have most abundantly justified the expenditures made in their behalf expenditures for which their respective states were not responsible but of which they reaped the benefit from one standpoint however the so-called higher education did most undoubtedly complicate the problem those critics of the race who felt that the only function of negroes in life was that of hewers of wood and drawers of water quite fully realized that negroes who had been to college did not care to work longer as field laborers some were to prove scientific students of agriculture but as a group they were out of the class of peons in this they were just like white people and all other people no one who has once seen the light chooses to live always on the plane of the man with the hoe nor need it be thought that these students are unduly crowding into professional pursuits while for instance the number of negro physicians and dentists has greatly increased within recent years the number would still have to be four or five times as great to sustain to the total negro population the same proportion as that borne by the whole number of white physicians and dentists to the total white population the subjects of the criminality and the mortality of the race are in their ultimate reaches closely related both being mainly due as we have suggested to the conditions under which negroes have been forced to live in the country districts until nineteen hundred at least there was little provision for improvements in methods of cooking or in sanitation while in cities the effects of inferior housing poor and unlighted streets and of the segregation of vice in negro neighborhoods could not be otherwise than obvious thus it happened in such a year as eighteen ninety eight that in baltimore the negro death rate was somewhat more and in nashville just a little less and twice that of the white people legal procedure moreover emphasized the vicious circle living conditions sent the negroes to the courts in increasing numbers and the courts sent them still farther down in the scale there were undoubtedly some negro thieves some negro murderers and some negroes who were incontinent no race has yet appeared on the face of the earth that did not contain members having such propensities and all such people should be dealt with justly by law our present contention is that throughout the period of which we are now speaking the dominant social system was not only such as to accentuate criminal elements but also such as even sought to discourage aspiring men a few illustrations drawn from widely different phases of life must suffice in the spring of nineteen o three and again in nineteen o four jackson w giles of montgomery county alabama contended before the supreme court of the united states that he and other negroes in his county were wrongfully excluded from the franchise by the new alabama constitution twice was his case thrown out on technicalities the first time it was said because he was petitioning for the right to vote under a constitution whose validity he denied and the second time because the federal right that he claimed had not been passed on in the state court from whose decision he appealed thus the supreme tribunal in the united states evaded at the time any formal judgment as to the real validity of the new suffrage provisions in nineteen o three moreover in alabama negroes charged with petty offences and sometimes with no offence at all were still sent to convict farms or turned over to contractors they were sometimes compelled to work as peons for a length of time and they were flogged starved hunted with bloodhounds and sold from one contractor to another in direct violation of law one joseph patterson borrowed one dollar on a saturday promising to pay the amount on the following tuesday morning he did not get to town at the appointed time and he was arrested and carried before a justice of the peace who found him guilty of obtaining money under false pretenses no time whatever was given to the negro to get witnesses or a lawyer or to get money with which to pay his fine and the costs of court he was sold for twenty-five dollars to a man named hardy who worked him for a year and then sold him for forty dollars to another man 
named Pace. Patterson tried to escape, but was recaptured and given a sentence of six months more. He was then required to serve for an additional year to pay a doctor's bill. When the case at last attracted attention, it appeared that for one dollar borrowed in 1903, he was not finally to be released before 1906. Another case of interest and importance was set in New York in the spring of 1909. A Pullman porter was arrested on the charge of stealing a card case containing twenty dollars. The next day he was discharged as innocent. He then entered against his accuser a suit for ten thousand dollars damages. The jury awarded him two thousand five hundred dollars, which amount the court reduced to three hundred dollars. Justice P. H. Dugro, saying that a Negro, when falsely imprisoned, did not suffer the same amount of injury that a white man would suffer, an opinion which the New York age very naturally characterized as one of the basest and most offensive ever handed down by a New York judge. In the history of the question of the mulatto, two facts are outstanding. One is that the before the Civil War, as was very natural under the circumstances, mulattoes became free much faster than pure Negroes. Thus the census of 1850 showed that 581 of every 1,000 free Negroes were mulattoes, and only 83 of every 1,000 slaves. Since the Civil War, moreover, the mulatto element has rapidly increased, advancing from 11.2% of the Negro population in 1850 to 20.9% 20 in 1910, or from 126 to 264 per 1,000. On the whole question of the function of this mixed element, the elaborate study that of Reuter is immediately thrown out of court by its lack of accuracy. The fundamental facts on which it rests its case are not always true, and if premises or false conclusions are worthless, no work on the Negro that calls to saint Louverture and Sojourner Truth Mulattoes, and that will not give the race credit for several well-known pure Negroes of the present day, can long command the attention of scholars. This whole argument on the mulatto goes back to the fallacy of degrading human beings by slavery for two hundred years, and then arguing that they have not the capacity or the inclination to rise. In a country predominantly white, the quadroon has frequently been given some advantage that his black friend did not have from the time that one was a house servant and the other a field hand. But no scientific test has ever demonstrated that the black boy is intellectually inferior to the fair one. In America, however, it is the fashion to place upon the Negro any blame or deficiency and to claim for the white race any merit that an individual may show. Furthermore, and this is a point not often remarked in discussions of the problem, the element of genius that distinguishes the Negro artist of mixed blood is most frequently one characteristically Negro rather than Anglo-Saxon. Much has been made of the fact that within the society of the race itself there have been lines of cleavage, a comparatively few people very fair in color, sometimes drawing off to themselves. This is a fact, and it is simply one more heritage from slavery, most tenacious in some conservative cities along the coast. Even there, however, old lines are vanishing, and the fusion of different groups within the race rapidly going forward. Undoubtedly, there has been some snobbery, as there always is, and a few quadrants and octoroons have crossed the color line and been lost to the race. But these cases are, after all, comparatively few in number, and the younger generation is more and more emphasizing the ideals of racial solidarity. In the future, there may continue to be lines of cleavage in society within the race, but the standards governing these will primarily be character and merit. On the whole, then, the mulatto has placed himself squarely on the side of the difficulties, aspirations, and achievements of the Negro people, and it is simply an accident and not inherent quality that accounts for the fact that he has been so prominent in the leadership of the race. The final refutation of defamation, however, is to be found in the actual achievement of members of the race themselves. The progress, in spite of handicaps, continued to be amazing. 
said the new york sun early in nineteen o seven copied by the times of negroes who have made good junius c groves of kansas produces seventy five thousand bushels of potatoes every year the world's record alfred smith received the blue ribbon at the world's fair and first prize in england for his oklahoma raised cotton some of the thirty-five patented devices of granville t woods the electrician formed part of the systems of the new york elevated railways and the bell telephone company w sidney pittman drew the design of the colas p huntingdon memorial building the largest and finest as tuskegee daniel h williams m d of chicago was the first surgeon to sew up and heal a wounded human heart mary church terrell addressed in three languages at berlin recently the international association for the advancement of women edward h morris won his suit between cook county and the city of chicago and as a law practice worth twenty thousand dollars a year in one department of effort that of sport the negro was especially prominent in pugilism a diversion that has always been noteworthy for its popular appeal peter jackson was well known as a contemporary of john l sullivan george dixon was with the exception of one year either bantamweight or featherweight champion for the whole of the period from eighteen ninety to nineteen hundred and joe gans was lightweight champion from nineteen o two to nineteen o eight joe walcott was welterweight champion from nineteen o one to nineteen o four and was succeeded by dixie kidd who held his place from nineteen o four to nineteen o eight in nineteen o eight to the chagrin of thousands and with a victory that occasioned a score of racial conflicts throughout the south and west and that resulted in several deaths jack johnson became the heavyweight champion of america a position that he was destined to hold for seven years in professional baseball the negro was proscribed though occasionally a member of the race played on teams of the second group of semi-professional teams the american giants and the leland giants of chicago and the lincoln giants of new york were popular favorites and frequently numbered on their roles players of the first order of ability in intercollegiate baseball w c matthews of harvard was outstanding for several years about nineteen o four in intercollegiate football lewis at harvard in the earlier nineties and bullock at dartmouth a decade later were unusually prominent while marshall of minnesota in 1905 became an all-american end pollard of brown a halfback in 1916 and robeson of rutgers an end in 1918 also won all-american honors about the turn of the century major taylor was a champion bicycle rider and john b taylor of pennsylvania was an intercollegiate champion in track athletics similar fifteen years later binga dismond of howard and chicago sole butler of dubuque and howard p drew of southern california were destined to win national and even international honors in track work drew broke numerous records as a runner and butler was the winner in the broad jump at the inter-allied games in the pershing stadium in paris in nineteen twenty e gordon of harvard came prominently forward as one of the best track athletes that institution had ever had in the face then of the negro's unquestionable physical ability and prowess the supreme criticism that he was called on to face within the period was all the more hard to bear in all nations and in all ages courage under fire as a soldier has been regarded as the sterling test of manhood and by this standard we have seen that in war the negro had more than vindicated himself his very honor as a soldier was now to be attacked in august nineteen o six companies b c and d of the twenty fifth regiment united states infantry were stationed at fort brown brownsville texas where they were forced to exercise very great self-restraint in the face of daily insults from the citizens on the night of the thirteenth occurred a riot in which one citizen of the town was killed another wounded and the chief of police injured the people of the town accused the soldiers of causing the riot and demanded their removal brigadier general e a garlington inspector general was sent to find the guilty men and failing in his mission he recommended dishonorable discharge for the regiment on this recommendation president roosevelt on november nine dismissed without honor the entire battalion disqualifying its members for service thereafter in either the military or the civil employ of the united states 
when congress met in december senator j b four raker of ohio placed himself at the head of the critics of the president's action and in a ringing speech said of the discharged men that they asked no favors because they were negroes but only justice because they were men on january twenty two the senate authorized a general investigation of the whole matter a special message from the president on the fourteenth having revoked the civil disability of the discharged soldiers the case was finally disposed of by a congressional act approved march three nineteen o nine which appointed a court of inquiry before which any discharged man who wished to re-enlist had the burden of establishing his innocence a procedure which clearly violated the fundamental principle in law that a man is to be accounted innocent until he is proved guilty in connection with the dishonored soldier of brownsville and indeed with reference to the negro throughout the period we recall edwin markham's poem dreyfus written for a far different occasion but with fundamental principles of justice that are eternal one a man stood stained france was one alp of hate pressing upon him with the whole world's weight in all the circle of the ancient sun there was no voice to speak for him not one in all the world of men there was no sound but of a sword flung broken to the ground hell laughed its little hour and then behold how one by one the guarded gates unfold swiftly a sword by unseen forces hurled and now a man rising against the world two o oh, import deep as life is deep as time there is a something sacred and sublime moving behind the worlds beyond our ken weighing the stars weighing the deeds of men take heart o soul of sorrow and be strong there is one greater than the whole world's wrong be hushed before the high benignant power that moves wool shod through sepulchre and tower no truth so low but he will give it crown no wrong so high but he will hurl it down o men that forge the fetter it is vain there is a still hand stronger than your chain tis no avail to bargain sneer and nod and shrug the shoulder for reply to god seven the dawn of a to-morrow the bitter period that we have been considering was not wholly without its bright features and with the new century new voices began to be articulate in may nineteen hundred there was in montgomery a conference in which southern men undertook as never before to make a study of their problems that some who came had yet no real conception of the task and its difficulties may be seen from the suggestion of one man that the negroes be deported to the west or to the islands of the sea several men advocated the repeal of the fifteenth amendment the position outstanding for its statesmanship was that of ex-governor william a mccorkle of west virginia who asserted that the right to franchise was the vital and underlying principle of the life of the people of the united states and must not be violated that the remedy for present conditions was an honest and inflexible educational and property basis administered fairly for black and white and finally that the negro problem was not a local problem but one to be settled by the hearty cooperation of all the people of the united states meanwhile the southern educational congress continued its sittings from year to year and about nineteen o one there developed new and great interest in education the southern education board acting in close cooperation with the general education board the medium of the philanthropy of john d rockefeller and frequently also with the peabody and slater funds in nineteen o seven came the announcement of the jeans fund established by anna t jeans a quaker of philadelphia for the education of the negro in the rural districts of the south and in nineteen eleven that of the phelps stokes fund established by caroline phelps stokes with emphasis on the education of the negro in africa and america more and more these agencies were to work in harmony and cooperation with the officials in the different states concerned in nineteen hundred j l m curry a southern man of great breadth of culture was still in charge of the peabody and slater funds but he was soon to pass from the scene and in the work now to be done were prominent robert c ogden hollis b frissell wallace buttrick george foster peabody and james h dillard 
along with the mob violence moreover the disgrace the opening years of the century was an increasing number of officers who were disposed to do their duty even under trying circumstances less than two months after his notorious inaugural governor Vardaman of mississippi interested the reading public by ordering out a company of militia when a lynching was practically announced to take place and by boarding a special train to the scene to save the negro in this same state in nineteen o nine when the legislature passed a law levying a tax for the establishment of agricultural schools for white students and levied this on the property of white people and negroes alike though only the white people were to have schools a jasper county negro contested the matter before the chancery court which declared the law unconstitutional and he was further supported by the supreme court of the state such a decision was inspiring but it was not the rule and already the problems of another decade were being foreshadowed already also under the stress of conditions in the south many negroes were seeking a haven in the north by nineteen hundred there were as many negroes in pennsylvania as in missouri whereas twenty years before there had been twice as many in the latter state there were in massachusetts more than in delaware whereas twenty years before delaware had had fifty per cent more than massachusetts within twenty years virginia gained three hundred and twelve thousand white people and only twenty nine thousand negroes the latter having begun a steady movement to new york north carolina gained four hundred thousand white people and only ninety three thousand negroes south carolina and mississippi however were not yet affected in large measure by the movement the race indeed was beginning to be possessed by a new consciousness after eighteen ninety five booker t washington was a very genuine leader from the first however there was a distinct group of negro men who honestly questioned the ultimate wisdom of the so-called atlanta compromise and who felt that in seeming to be willing temporarily to accept proscription and to waive political rights dr washington had given up too much sometimes also there was something in his illustrations of the effects of current methods of education that provoked reply those who were of the opposition however were not at first united and constructive and in their utterances they sometimes offended by harshness of tone dr washington himself said of the extremists in this group that they frequently understood theories but not things that in college they gave little thought to preparing for any definite task in the world but started out with the idea of preparing themselves to solve the race problem and that many of them made a business of keeping the troubles wrongs and hardships of the negro race before the public there was ample ground for this criticism more and more however the opposition gained force the guardian a weekly paper edited in boston by monroe trotter was particularly outspoken and in boston the real climax came in nineteen o three in an endeavor to break up a meeting at which dr washington was to speak then beginning in january nineteen o four the voice of the negro a magazine published in atlanta for three years definitely helped toward the cultivation of racial ideals publication of the periodical became irregular after the atlanta massacre and it finally expired in nineteen o seven some of the articles dealt with older and more philosophical themes but there were also bright and illuminating studies in education and other social topics as well as strong stand on political issues the colored american published in boston just a few years before the voice began to appear also did inspiring work various local or state organizations moreover from time to time showed the virtue of cooperation thus the georgia equal rights convention assembled in macon in february nineteen o six at the call of william j white the veteran editor of the georgia baptist brought together representative men from all over the state and considered such topics as the unequal division of school taxes the deprivation of the jury rights of negroes the peonage system and the penal system in nineteen o five twenty-nine men of the race launched what was known as the niagara movement the aims of this organization were freedom of speech and criticism an unlettered and unsubsidized press manhood suffrage the abolition of all caste distinctions based simply on race and color the recognition of the principle of human brotherhood as a practical present creed the recognition of the highest and best training as the monopoly of no class or race a belief in the dignity of labor and united effort to realize these ideals under wise and courageous leadership the time was not yet quite propitious and the niagara movement as such died after three or four years 
its principles lived on however and it greatly helped toward the formation of a stronger and more permanent organization in nineteen o nine a number of people who were interested in the general effect of the negro problem on democracy in america organized in new york the national association for the advancement of colored people it was felt that the situation had become so bad that the time had come for a simple declaration of human rights in nineteen ten moorfield story a distinguished lawyer of boston became national president and w e burkhart du bois director of publicity and research and editor of the crisis which period periodical began publication in november of this year the organization was successful from the first and local branches were formed all over the country some years elapsing however before the south was penetrated said the director of two things we negroes have dreamed for many years an organization so effective and so powerful that when discrimination and injustice touch one negro it would touch twelve million we have not got this yet but we have taken a great step toward it we have dreamed too of an organization that would work ceaselessly to make americans know that the so-called negro problem is simply one phase of the vaster problem of democracy in america and that those who wish freedom and justice for their country must wish it for every black citizen this is the great and insistent message of the national association for the advancement of colored people this organization is outstanding as an effort in cooperation between the races for the improvement of the condition of the negro of special interest along the line of economic betterment has been the national league on urban conditions among negroes now known as the national urban league which also has numerous branches with headquarters in new york and through whose offices thousands of negroes have been placed in honorable employment the national urban league was also formally organized in nineteen ten it represented a merging of the different agencies working in new york city in behalf of the social betterment of the negro population especially of the national league for the protection of colored women and of the committee for improving the industrial conditions among negroes in new york both of which agencies had been organized in nineteen o six as we shall see the work of the league was to be greatly expanded within the next decade by the conditions brought about by the war and under the direction of the executive secretary eugene nichol jones with the assistance of alert and patriotic officers its work was to prove one of genuinely national service interesting also was a new concern on the part of the young southern college man about the problems at his door within just a few years after the close of the period now considered phelps stokes fellowships for the study of problems relating to the negro were founded at the universities of virginia and georgia it was expected that similar fellowships would be founded in other institutions and there was interest in the annual meetings of the southern sociological congress and the university commission on southern race questions thus from one direction and another at length broke upon a veil of tears a new day of effort and of hope for the real contest the forces were gathering the next decade was to be one of unending bitterness and violence but also one in which the negro was to rise as never before to the dignity of self-reliant and courageous manhood End of section twenty five section twenty six of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen the negro in the new age part one one character of the period the decade nineteen ten to nineteen twenty momentous in the history of the world in the history of the negro race in america must finally be regarded as the period of a great spiritual uprising against the proscription the defamation and the violence of the preceding twenty years as never before the negro began to realize that the ultimate burden of his salvation rested upon himself and he learned to respect and to depend upon himself accordingly the decade naturally divides into two parts that before and that after the beginning of the great war in europe even in the earlier years however the tendencies that later were dominant were beginning to be manifest the greater part of the ten years was consumed by the two administrations of president woodrow wilson and not only did the national government 
in the course of these administrations discriminate openly against persons of negro descent in the federal service and fail to protect those who happened to live in the capital but its policy also gave encouragement to outrage in places technically said to be beyond its jurisdiction a great war was to give new occasion a new opportunity for discrimination defamatory propaganda was to be circulated on a scale undreamed of before and the close of the war was to witness attempts for a new reign of terror in the south even beyond the bounds of continental america the race was now to suffer by reason of the national policy and the little republic of haiti to lift its bleeding hands to the calm judgment of the world both a cause and a result of the struggle through which the race was now to pass was its astonishing progress the fiftieth anniversary of the emancipation proclamation january one nineteen thirteen called to mind as did nothing else the proscription and the mistakes but also the successes and the hopes of the negro people in america throughout the south disfranchisement seemed almost complete and yet after many attempts the movement finally failed in maryland in nineteen eleven and in arkansas in nineteen twelve in nineteen fifteen moreover the disfranchising act of oklahoma was declared unconstitutional by the united states supreme court and henceforth the negro could feel that the highest legal authority was no longer on the side of those who sought to deprive him of all political voice eleven years before the court had taken refuge in technicalities the year nineteen eleven was also marked by the appointment of the first negro policeman in new york by the election of the first negro legislator in pennsylvania and by the appointment of a man of the race william h lewis as an assistant attorney general of the united states and several civil rights suits were won in massachusetts new york and new jersey banks insurance companies and commercial and industrial enterprises were constantly being capitalized churches erected more and more stately edifices and fraternal organizations constantly increased in membership and wealth by nineteen thirteen the odd fellows numbered very nearly half a million members and owned property worth two and a half million dollars in nineteen twenty the dunbar amusement corporation of philadelphia erected a theatre costing four hundred thousand dollars and the foremost businesswoman of the race in the decade madame c j walker on the simple business of toilet articles and hair preparations built up an enterprise of national scope and conducted in accordance with the principles regularly governing great american commercial organizations fifty years after emancipation moreover very nearly one-fourth of all the negroes in the southern states were living in homes that they themselves owned thus four hundred and thirty thousand four hundred and forty nine of one million nine hundred and seventeen thousand three hundred and ninety one houses occupied in these states were reported in nineteen ten as owned and three hundred and fourteen thousand three hundred and forty were free of all encumbrance the percentage of illiteracy decreased from seventy in eighteen eighty to thirty point four in nineteen ten and movements were under way for the still more rapid spread of elementary knowledge excellent high schools such as those in st louis washington kansas city both cities of this name louisville baltimore and other cities and towns in the border states and sometimes as far away as texas were setting a standard such as was in accord with the best in the country and in one year nineteen seventeen four hundred and fifty-five young people of the race received the degree of bachelor of arts while throughout the decade different ones received honors and took the highest graduate degrees at the foremost institutions of learning in the country early in the decade the general education board began actively to assist in the work of the higher educational institutions 
and an outstanding gift was that of half a million dollars to fisk university in nineteen twenty meanwhile through the national urban league and hundreds of local clubs and welfare organizations social betterment went forward much impetus being given to the work by the national association of colored women's clubs organized in eighteen ninety six along with its progress throughout the decade the race had to meet increasing bitterness and opposition and this was intensified by the motion picture the birth of a nation built on lines similar to those of the klansmen negro men standing high on civil service lists were sometimes set aside in nineteen thirteen the white railway mail clerks of the south began an open campaign against negroes in the service in direct violation of the rules and a little later in the same year segregation in the different departments became notorious in nineteen eleven the american bar association raised the question of the color line and efforts for the restriction of negroes to certain neighborhoods in different prominent cities sometimes resulted in violence as in the dynamiting of the homes of negroes in kansas city missouri in nineteen eleven when the progressive party was organized in nineteen twelve the negro was given to understand that his support was not sought and in nineteen eleven a strike of firemen on the queen and crescent railroad was in its main outline similar to the trouble on the georgia railroad two years before meanwhile in the south the race received only eighteen per cent of the total expenditures for education although it constituted more than thirty per cent of the population worse than anything else however was the matter of lynching in each year the total number of victims of illegal execution continued to number three or four score but no one could ever be sure that every instance had been recorded between the opening of the decade and the time of the entrance of the united states into the war five cases were attended by such unusual circumstances that the public could not soon forget them at coatesville pennsylvania not far from philadelphia on august twelfth nineteen eleven a negro laborer zach walker while drunk fatally shot a night watchman he was pursued and attempted suicide wounded he was brought to town and placed in the hospital from this place he was taken chained to his cot dragged for some miles and then tortured and burned to death in the presence of a great crowd of people including many women and his bones and the links of the chain which bound him distributed as souvenirs in monticello georgia in january nineteen fifteen when a negro family resisted an officer who was making an arrest the father dan barber his young son and his two daughters were all hanged to a tree and their bodies riddled with bullets before the close of the year there was serious trouble in the southwestern portion of the state and behind this lay all the evils of the system of peonage in the black belt driven to desperation by the mistreatment accorded them in the raising of cotton the negroes at last killed an overseer who had whipped a negro boy a reign of terror was then instituted churches society halls and homes were burnt and several individuals shot on december thirty there was a wholesale lynching of six negroes in early county less than three weeks afterwards a sheriff who attempted to arrest some more negroes and who was accompanied by a mob was killed then january twenty nineteen sixteen five negroes who had been taken from the jail in worth county were rushed in automobiles into lee county adjoining and hanged and shot on may fifteenth nineteen sixteen at waco texas jesse washington a sullen and overgrown boy of seventeen who worked for a white farmer named fryer at the town of robinson six miles away and who one week before had criminally assaulted and killed mrs fryer after unspeakable mutilation was burned in the heart of the town a part of the torture consisted in stabbing with knives and the cutting off of the boy's fingers as he grabbed the chain by which he was bound finally on october twenty one nineteen sixteen anthony crawford a negro farmer of abbeville south carolina who owned four hundred and twenty seven acres of the best cotton land in his county and who was reported to be worth twenty thousand dollars was lynched 
he had come to town to the store of w d barksdale to sell a load of cotton seed and the two men had quarrelled about the price although no blow was struck on either side a little later however crawford was arrested by a local policeman and a crowd of idlers from the public square rushed to give him a whipping for his impudence he promptly knocked down the ringleader with a hammer the mob then set upon him nearly killed him and at length threw him into the jail a few hours later fearing that the sheriff would secretly remove the prisoner it returned dragged the wounded man forth and then hanged and shot him after which proceedings warning was sent to his family to leave the county by the middle of the next month it will be observed that in these five noteworthy occurrences in only one case was there any question of criminal assault on the other hand in one case two young women were included among the victims another was really a series of lynchings emphasizing the lot of some negroes under a vicious economic system and the last simply grew out of the jealousy and hatred aroused by a negro of independent means who knew how to stand up for his rights such was the progress such also the violence that the negro witnessed during the decade along with his problems at home he now began to have a, a new interest in those of his kin across the sea and this feeling was intensified by the world war it raises questions of such far-reaching importance however that it must receive separate and distinct treatment two migration east st louis very soon after the beginning of the great war in europe there began what will ultimately be known as the most remarkable migratory movement in the history of the negro in america migration had indeed at no time ceased since the great movement of eighteen seventy nine but for the most part it had been merely personal and not in response to any great emergency the sudden ceasing of the stream of immigration from europe however created an unprecedented demand for labor in the great industrial centers of the north and business men were not long in realizing the possibilities of a source that has yet been used in only the slightest degree special agents undoubtedly worked in some measure but the outstanding feature of the new migration was that it was primarily a mass movement and not one organized or encouraged by any special group of leaders labor was needed in railroad construction in the steel mills in the tobacco farms of connecticut and in the packing houses foundries and automobile plants in nineteen fifteen the new england tobacco growers hastily got together in new york two hundred girls but these proved to be unsatisfactory and it was realized that the labor supply would have to be more carefully supervised in january nineteen sixteen the management of the continental tobacco corporation definitely decided on the policy of importing workers from the south and within the next year not less than three thousand negroes came to hartford several hundred being students from the schools and colleges who went north to work for the summer in the same summer came also trainloads of negroes from jacksonville and other points to work for the erie and pennsylvania railroads those who left their homes in the south to find new ones in the north thus worked first of all in response to a new economic demand prominent in their thought to urge them on however were the generally unsatisfactory conditions in the south from which they had so long suffered and from which all too often there had seemed to be no escape as it was they were sometimes greatly embarrassed in leaving in jacksonville the city council passed an ordinance requiring that agents who wished to recruit labor to be sent out of the state should pay one thousand dollars for a license or suffer a fine of six hundred dollars and spend sixty days in jail macon georgia raised the license fee to twenty five thousand dollars in savannah the excitement was intense when two trains did not move as it was expected that they would three hundred negroes paid their own fares and went north later when the leaders of the movement could not be found the police arrested one hundred of the negroes and sent them to the police barracks charging them with loitering similar scenes were enacted elsewhere the south being then as ever unwilling to be deprived of its labor supply meanwhile wages for some men in such an industrial centre as birmingham he leaped to nine dollars and ten dollars a day 
all told hardly less than three-fourths of a million negroes went north within the four years nineteen fifteen to nineteen eighteen naturally such a great shifting of population did not take place without some inconvenience and hardship among the thousands who changed their place of residence were many ignorant and improvident persons but sometimes it was the most skilled artisans and the most substantial owners of homes in different communities who sold their property and moved away in the north they had once met congestion in housing facilities in philadelphia and pittsburgh this condition became so bad as to demand immediate attention in more than one place there were outbreaks in which lives were lost in east st louis illinois all of the social problems raised by the movement were seen in their baldest guise the original population of this city had come for the most part from georgia mississippi kentucky and tennessee it had long been an important industrial center it was also a very rough place the scene of prize fights and cock fights and a haven for escaped prisoners and there was very close connection between the saloons and politics for years the managers of the industrial plants had recruited their labor supply from ellis island when this failed they turned to the negroes of the south and difficulties were aggravated by a series of strikes on the part of the white workers by the spring of nineteen seventeen not less than ten thousand negroes had recently arrived in the city and the housing situation was so acute that these people were more and more being forced into the white localities sometimes negroes who had recently arrived wandered aimlessly about the streets where they met the rougher elements of the city there were frequent fights and also much trouble on the street cars the negroes interested themselves in politics and even succeeded in placing in office several men of their choice in february nineteen seventeen there was a strike of the white workers at the aluminum ore works this was adjusted at the time but the settlement was not permanent and meanwhile there were almost daily arrivals from the south and the east st louis journal was demanding make east st louis a lily white town there were preliminary riots on may twenty seven to thirty on the night of july one men in automobiles rode through the negro section and began firing promiscuously the next day the massacre broke forth in all its fury and before it was over hundreds of thousands of dollars in property had been destroyed six thousand negroes had been driven from their homes and about one hundred and fifty shot burned hanged or maimed for life officers of the law failed to do their duty and the testimony of victims as to the torture inflicted upon them was such as to send a thrill of horror through the heart of the american people later there was a congressional investigation but from this nothing very material resulted in the last week of this same month july nineteen seventeen there were also serious outbreaks in both chester and philadelphia pennsylvania the fundamental issues being the same as in east st louis meanwhile welfare organizations earnestly labored to adjust the negro in his new environment in chicago the different state clubs helped nobly greater than any other one agency however was the national urban league whose work now witnessed an unprecedented expansion representative was the work of the detroit branch which was not content merely with finding vacant positions but approached manufacturers of all kinds through distribution of literature and by personal visits and within twelve months was successful in placing not less than one thousand negroes in employment other than unskilled labor it also established a bureau of investigation and information regarding housing conditions and generally aimed at the proper moral and social care of those who needed its service the whole problem of the negro was of such commanding importance after the united states entered the war as to lead to the creation of a special division of negro economics in the office of the secretary of labor to the directorship of which dr georgie e. haynes was called in january nineteen eighteen a conference of migration was called in new york under the auspices of the national urban league and this placed before the american federation of labor resolutions asking that negro labor be considered on the same basis as white the federation had long been debating the whole question of the negro and did not seem to be able to arrive at a clear-cut policy though its general attitude was unfavorable in nineteen nineteen however 
it voted to take steps to recognize and admit negro unions at last it seemed to realize the necessity of making allies of negro workers and of course any such change of front on the part of white workmen would menace some of the foundations of racial strife in the south and indeed in the country at large just how effective the new decision was to be in actual practice remained to be seen especially as the whole labor movement was thrown on the defensive by the end of nineteen twenty however special interest attached to the events in bogalusa louisiana in november nineteen nineteen here were the headquarters of the great southern lumber company whose sawmill in the place was said to be the largest in the world for some time it had made use of unorganized negro labor as against the white labor unions the forces of labor however began to organize the negroes in the employ of the company which held political as well as capitalistic control in the community the company then began to have negroes arrested on charges of vagrancy taking them before the city court and having them fined and turned over to the company to work out the fines under the guard of gunmen in the troubles that came to a head on november twenty two three white men were shot and killed one of them being the district president of the american federation of labor who was helping to give protection to a colored organizer the full significance of this incident remained also to be seen but it is quite possible that in the final history of the negro problem the skirmish at bogalusa will mark the beginning of the end of the exploiting of negro labor and the first recognition of the identity of interest between white and black workmen in the south three the great war just on the eve of america's entrance into the war in europe occurred an incident that from the standpoint of the negro at least must finally appear simply as the prelude to the great contest to come once more at an unexpected moment ten years after brownsville the loyalty and heroism of the negro soldier impressed the american people the expedition of the american forces into mexico in nineteen sixteen with the political events attending this is a long story the outstanding incident however was that in which two troops of the tenth cavalry engaged about eighty men had been sent a long distance from the main line of the american army their errand being supposedly the pursuit of a deserter at or near the town of carizal the americans seemed to have chosen to go through the town rather than around it and the result was a clash in which captain boyd who commanded the detachment and some twenty of his men were killed twenty-two others being captured by the mexicans under the circumstances the whole venture was rather imprudent in the first place as to the engagement itself the mexicans said that the american troops made the attack while the latter said that the mexicans themselves first opened fire however this may have been all other phases of the mexican problem seemed for the moment to be forgotten at washington in the demand for the release of the twenty-two men who had been taken there was no reason for holding them and they were brought up to el paso within a few days and sent across the line thus though some one had blundered these negro soldiers did their duty theirs not to make reply theirs but to do and die so in the face of odds they fought like heroes and twenty died beneath the mexican stars when the united states entered the war in europe in april nineteen seventeen the question of overwhelming importance to the negro people was naturally that of their relation to the great conflict in which their country had become engaged their response to the draft call set a noteworthy example of loyalty to all other elements in the country at the very outset the race faced a terrible dilemma if there were to be special training camps for officers and if the national government would make no provisions otherwise did it wish to have a special camp for negroes such as would give formal approval to a policy of segregation or did it wish to have no camp at all on such terms and thus lose the opportunity to have any men of the race specially trained as officers the camp was secured camp dodge near des moines iowa and throughout the summer of nineteen seventeen the work of training went forward the heart of a harassed and burdened people responding more and more with pride to the work of their men on october fifteenth six hundred and twenty five became commissioned officers and all told twelve hundred received commissions to the fighting forces of the united states the race furnished altogether very nearly four hundred thousand men of whom just a little more than half actually saw service in europe 
negro men served in all branches of the military establishment and also as surveyors and draftsmen for the handling of many of the questions relating to them emmett j scott was on october one nineteen seventeen appointed special assistant to the secretary of war mr scott had for a number of years assisted dr booker t washington as secretary at tuskegee institute and in nineteen o nine he was one of the three members of the special commission appointed by president taft for the investigation of liberian affairs negro nurses were authorized by the war department for service in base hospitals at six army camps and women served also as canteen workers in france and in charge of hostess houses in the united states sixty negro men served as chaplains three hundred and fifty as y m c a secretaries and others in special capacities service of exceptional value was rendered by negro women in industry and very largely also they maintained and promoted the food supply through agriculture at the same time that they released men for service at the front meanwhile the race invested billions of dollars in liberty bonds and war savings stamps and contributed generously to the red cross y m c a and other relief agencies in the summer of nineteen eighteen interest naturally centered upon the actual performance of negro soldiers in france and upon the establishment of units of the students army training corps in twenty leading educational institutions when these units were demobilized in december nineteen eighteen provision was made in a number of the schools for the formation of units of the reserve officers training corps the remarkable record made by the negro in the previous wars of the country was fully equaled by that in the great war negro soldiers fought with special distinction in the argonne forest at chateau thierry in below wood in the st mihal district in the champagne sector at vosca and metz winning often very high praise from their commanders entire regiments of negro troops were cited for exceptional valor and decorated with a croix de guerre the three hundred and sixty ninth the three hundred and seventy first and the three hundred and seventy second while groups of officers and men of the three hundred and sixty fifth the three hundred and sixty sixth the three hundred and sixty eighth the three hundred and seventieth and the first battalion of the three hundred and sixty seventh were also decorated at the close of the war the highest negro officers in the army were lieutenant colonel otis b duncan commander of the third battalion of the three hundred and seventieth formerly the eighth illinois and the highest-ranking negro officer in the american expeditionary forces colonel charles young retired on special duty at camp grant illinois colonel franklin a dennison of the three hundred and seventieth infantry and lieutenant colonel benjamin o davis of the ninth cavalry the three hundred and seventieth was the first american regiment stationed in the st mihiel sector it was one of the three that occupied a sector at verdun when a penetration there would have been disastrous to the allied cause and it went direct from the training camp to the firing line noteworthy also was the record of the three hundred and sixty ninth infantry formerly the fifteenth regiment new york national guard this organization was under the shell fire for one hundred and ninety one days and it held one trench for ninety one days without relief it was the first unit of allied fighters to reach the rhine going down as an advance guard of the french army of occupation a prominent hero in this regiment was sergeant henry johnson who returned with the croix de guerre with one star in one palm he is credited with routing a party of germans at bois hansi in the argonne on may five nineteen eighteen with singularly heavy losses to the enemy many other men acted with similar bravery hardly less heroic was the service of the stevedore regiments or the thousands of men in the army who did not go to france but who did their duty as they were commanded at home general vincenden said of the men of the three hundred and seventieth fired by a noble ardor they go at times even beyond the objectives given them by the higher command they have always wished to be in the front line and general corbet said of the three hundred and seventy first and the three hundred and seventy second the most powerful defenses the most strongly organized machine-gun nests the heaviest artillery barrages nothing could stop them these crack regiments overcame every obstacle with the most complete contempt for danger they have shown us the way to victory in spite of his noble record perhaps in some measure because of it and in the face of his loyal response to the call to duty 
the negro unhappily became in the course of the war the victim of proscription and propaganda probably without parallel in the history of the country no effort seems to have been spared to discredit him both as a man and as a soldier in both france and america the apparent object of the forces working against him was the intention to prevent any feeling that the war would make any change in the condition of the race at home in the south negroes were sometimes forced into peonage and restrained in their efforts to go north and generally they had no representation on local boards the draft was frequently operated so as to be unfair to them and every man who registered found special provision for the indication of his race in the corner of his card accordingly in many localities negroes contributed more than their quota this being the result of favoritism shown to white draftees the first report of the provost marshal general showed that of every one hundred negroes called thirty-six were certified for service while of every one hundred white men called only twenty-five were certified of those summoned in class one negroes contributed fifty one point sixty five per cent of their registrants as against thirty two point fifty three per cent of the white in france the work of defamation was manifest and flagrant slanders about the negro soldiers were deliberately circulated among the french people sometimes on very high authority much of this propaganda growing out of a jealous fear of any acquaintance whatsoever of the negro men with the french women especially insolent and sometimes brutal were the men of the military police who at times shot and killed on the slightest provocation proprietors of sold to negro soldiers were sometimes boycotted and offences were magnified which in the case of white men never saw publication negro officers were discriminated against in hotel and travelling accommodations while upon the ordinary men in the service fell unduly any specially unpleasant duty such as that of reburying the dead white women engaged in wide work especially southern women showed a disposition not to serve negroes though the red cross and salvation army organizations were much better in this respect and finally the negro soldier was not given any place in the great victory parade in paris about the close of the war moreover a great picture or series of pictures the Pathéon de la guerre that was on a mammoth scale and that attracted extraordinary attention was noteworthy as giving representation to all of the forces and divisions of the allied armies except the negroes and the forces from the united states not unnaturally the germans endeavored though without success to capitalize the situation by circulating among the negroes insidious literature that sometimes made very strong points all of these things are to be considered by those people in the united states who think that the negro suffers unduly from a grievance while the negro soldier abroad was thus facing unusual pressure in addition to the ordinary hardships of war at home occurred an incident that was doubly depressing coming as it did just a few weeks after the massacre of east st louis in august nineteen seventeen a battalion of the twenty fourth infantry stationed at houston texas to assist in the work of concentrating soldiers for the war in europe encountered the ill will of the town and between the city police and the negro military police there was constant friction at last when one of the negroes had been beaten word was circulated among his comrades that he had been shot and a number of them set out for revenge in the riot that followed august twenty three two of the negroes and seventeen white people of the town were killed the latter number including five policemen as a result of this encounter sixty-three members of the battalion were court-martialed at fort sam houston thirteen were hanged on december eleventh nineteen seventeen five more were executed on december thirteenth nineteen eighteen fifty-one were sentenced to life imprisonment at five two briefer terms and the negro people of the country felt very keenly the fact that the condemned men were hanged like common criminals rather than given the death of soldiers thus for one reason or another the whole matter of the war and the incidents connected therewith simply made the negro question more bitterly than ever the real disposition toward him of the government under which he lived and which he had striven so long to serve End of section twenty six section twenty seven of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen the negro in the new age part two four high tension washington chicago 
elaine such incidents abroad and such feeling at home as we have recorded not only agitated the negro people but gave thousands of other citizens concern and when the armistice suddenly came on november eleventh nineteen eighteen not only in the south but in localities elsewhere in the country racial feeling had been raised to the highest point about the same time there began to be spread abroad sinister rumors that the old ku klux were writing again and within a few months parades at night in representative cities in alabama and georgia left no doubt that the rumors were well founded the negro people fully realized the significance of the new movement and they felt full well the pressure being brought to bear upon them in view of the shortage of domestic servants in the south still more did they sense the situation that would face their sons and brothers when they returned from france but they were not afraid and in all of the riots of the period the noteworthy fact stands out that in some of the cities in which the situation was most tense notably atlanta and birmingham no great race trouble was permitted to start in general however the violence that had characterized the year nineteen seventeen continued through nineteen eighteen and nineteen nineteen in the one state of tennessee within less than a year and on separate occasions three negroes were burned at the stake on may twenty two nineteen seventeen near memphis l t person nearly fifty years of age was burned for the alleged assault and murder of a young woman and in this case the word alleged is used advisedly for the whole matter of the fixing of the blame for the crime and the fact that the man was denied a legal trial left grave doubt as to the extent of his guilt on sunday december two nineteen seventeen at dyersburg immediately after the adjournment of services in the churches of the town lation scott guilty of criminal assault was burned his eyes were put out with red hot irons a hot poker was rammed down his throat and he was mutilated in unmentionable ways two months later on february twelfth nineteen eighteen at estill springs jim mackill heron who had shot and killed two young white men was also burned at the stake in a still springs that had for some time been the sport of young white men in the community to throw rocks at single negroes and make them run late one afternoon mcgill heron went into a store to buy some candy as he passed out a remark was made by one of the three young men about his eating his candy the rest of the story is obvious as horrible as these burnings were it is certain that they did not grind the iron into the negro's soul any more surely than the three stories that follow hampton smith was known as one of the harshest employers of negro labor in brooks county georgia as it was difficult for him to get help otherwise he would go into the courts and whenever a negro was convicted and was unable to pay his fine or was sentenced to a term on the chain gang he would pay the fine and secure the man for work on his plantation he thus secured the services of sidney johnson fined thirty dollars for gambling after johnson had more than worked out the thirty dollars he asked pay for the additional time he served smith refused to give this and a quarrel resulted a few mornings later when johnson sick did not come to work smith found him in his cabin and beat him a few evenings later while smith was sitting in his home he was shot through a window and killed instantly and his wife was wounded as a result of this occurrence the negroes of both brooks and lowndes counties were terrorized for the week may seventeen through twenty four nineteen eighteen and not less than eleven of them lynched into the bodies of two men lynched together not less than seven hundred bullets are said to have been fired johnson himself had been shot dead when he was found but his body was mutilated dragged through the streets of aldosta and burned mary turner the wife of one of the victims said that her husband had been unjustly treated and that if she knew who had killed him 
she would have warrants sworn out against them for saying this she too was lynched although she was in an advanced state of pregnancy her ankles were tied together and she was hung to a tree head downward gasoline and oil from the automobiles near were thrown on her clothing and a match applied while she was yet alive her abdomen was cut open with a large knife and her unborn babe fell to the ground it gave two feeble cries and then its head was crushed by a member of the mob with his heel hundreds of bullets were then fired into the woman's body as a result of these events not less than five hundred negroes left the immediate vicinity of aldosta immediately and hundreds of others prepared to leave as soon as they could dispose of that land and this they proceeded to do in the face of the threat that any negro who attempted to leave would be regarded as implicated in the murder of smith and dealt with accordingly at the end of this same year on december twenty nineteen eighteen four young negroes major clark age twenty andrew clark age fifteen maggie house age twenty and alma house age sixteen were taken from the little jail at shabuda mississippi and lynched on a bridge near the town they were accused of the murder of e l johnston a white dentist though all protested their innocence the situation that preceded the lynching was significant major clark was in love with maggie howes and planned to marry her this thought enraged johnston who was soon to become the father of a child by the young woman and who told clark to leave her alone as the two sisters were about to be killed maggie screamed and fought crying i ain't guilty of killing the doctor and you oughtn't to kill me and to silence her cries one member of the mob struck her in the mouth with a monkey wrench knocking her teeth out on may twenty fourth nineteen nineteen at milan telfair county georgia two young white men jim dowdy and lewis evans went drunk late at night to the negro section of the town and to the home of a widow who had two daughters they were refused admittance and then fired into the house the girls frightened ran to another home they were pursued and Barry washington a respectable negro seventy-two years of age seized a shotgun intending to give them protection and in the course of the shooting that followed dowdy was killed the next night saturday the twenty fifth washington was taken to the place where dowdy was killed and his body shot to pieces it remained for the capital of the nation however largely to show the real situation of the race in the aftermath of a great war conducted by a democratic administration heretofore the federal government had declared itself powerless to act in the case of lawlessness in an individual state but it was now to have an opportunity to deal with violence in washington itself on july nineteenth nineteen nineteen a series of lurid and exaggerated stories in the daily papers of attempted assaults of negroes on white women resulted in an outbreak that was intended to terrorize the popular northwest section in which lived a large proportion of the negroes in the district of columbia for three days the violence continued intermittently and as the constituted police authority did practically nothing for the defense of the negro citizens the loss of life might have been infinitely greater than it was if the colored men of the city had not assumed their own defense as it was they saved the capital and earned the gratitude of the race and the nation it appeared that negroes educated law-abiding negroes would not now run when their lives and their homes were at stake and before such determination the mob retreated ingloriously just a week afterwards before the country had really caught its breath after the events in washington there burst into flame in chicago a race war of the greatest bitterness and fierceness for a number of years the western metropolis had been known as that city offering to the negro the best industrial and political opportunity in the country when the migration caused by the war was at its height tens of thousands of negroes from the south passed through the city going elsewhere but thousands also remained to work in the stockyards or other places with all of the coming and going the negroes in the city must at any time in nineteen eighteen or nineteen nineteen have numbered not less than one hundred and fifty thousand and banks cooperative societies and race newspapers flourished there were also abundant social problems awakened by the saloons and gambling dens and by the seamy side of politics those who had been longest in the city however rallied to the needs of the newcomers and in their homes 
their churches and their places of work endeavored to get them adjusted in their environment the housing situation in spite of all such effort became more and more acute and when some negroes were forced beyond the bounds of the old black belt there were attempts to dynamite their new residences meanwhile hundreds of young men who had gone to france or to cantonments eighteen fifty from the district of one draft board at state and thirty-fifth streets returned to find again a place in the life of chicago and daily from washington or from the south came the great waves of social unrest said arnold hill secretary of the chicago branch of the national urban league every time a lynching takes place in a community down south you can depend on it that colored people from that community will arrive in chicago inside of two weeks we have seen it happen so often that whenever we read newspaper dispatches of a public hanging or burning in a texas or a mississippi town we get ready to extend greetings to the people from the immediate vicinity of the lynching before the armistice was signed the league was each month finding work for seventeen hundred or eighteen hundred men and women in the following april the number fell to five hundred but with the coming of summer it rapidly rose again unskilled work was plentiful and jobs in foundries and steel mills in building and construction work and in light factories and packing houses kept up a steady demand for laborers meanwhile trouble was brewing and on the streets there were occasional encounters such was the situation when on a sunday at the end of july a negro boy at a bathing beach near twenty sixth street swam across an imaginary segregation line white boys threw rocks at him knocked him off a raft and he was drowned colored people rushed to a policeman and asked him to arrest the boys who threw the stones he refused to do so and as the dead body of the negro boy was being handled more rocks were thrown on both sides the trouble thus engendered spread through the negro district on the south side and for a week it was impossible or dangerous for people to go to work some employed at the stockyards could not get to their work for some days further at the end of three days twenty negroes were reported as dead fourteen white men were dead scores of people were injured and a number of houses of negroes burned in the face of this disaster the great soul of chicago rose above its materialism there were many conferences between representative people out of all the effort grew the determination to work for a nobler city and the sincerity was such as to give one hope not only for chicago but also for a new and better america the riots in washington and chicago were followed within a few weeks by outbreaks in knoxville and omaha in the latter place the fundamental cause of the trouble was social and political corruption and because he strongly opposed the lynching of william brown the negro the mayor of the city edward p smith very nearly lost his life as it was the county courthouse was burned one man more was killed and perhaps as many as forty injured more important even than this however and indeed one of the two or three most far-reaching instances of racial trouble in the history of the negro in america was the reign of terror in and near elaine phillips county arkansas in the first week of october nineteen nineteen the causes of this were fundamental and reached the very heart of the race problem and of the daily life of tens of thousands of negroes many negro tenants in eastern arkansas as in other states were still living under a share system by which the owner furnished the land and the negro the labor and by which at the end of the year the two supposedly got equal parts of the crop meanwhile throughout the year the tenant would get his food clothing and other supplies at exorbitant prices from a commissary operated by the planter or his agent and in actual practice the landowner and the tenant did not go together to a city to dispose of the crop when it was gathered as was sometimes done elsewhere but the landowner alone sold the crop and settled with the tenant whenever and however he pleased nor at the time of settlement was any itemized statement of supplies given only the total amount owed being stated obviously the planter could regularly pad his accounts keep the negro in debt and be assured of his labor supply from year to year in nineteen eighteen the price of cotton was constantly rising and at length reached forty cents a pound even with the cheating to which the negroes were subjected it became difficult to keep them in debt 
and they became more and more insistent in their demands for itemized statements nevertheless some of those whose cotton was sold in october nineteen eighteen did not get any statement of any sort before july of the next year seeing no other way out of this difficulty sixty-eight of the negroes got together and decided to hire a lawyer who would help them to get statements of their accounts and settlement at the right figures feeling that the life of any negro lawyer who took such a case would be endangered they employed the firm of bratton and bratton of little rock they made contracts with this firm to handle the sixty-eight cases at fifty dollars each in cash and a percentage of the monies collected from the white planters some of the negroes also planned to go before the federal grand jury and charge certain planters with peonage they had secret meetings from time to time in order to collect the money to be paid in advance and to collect the evidence which would enable them successfully to prosecute their cases some negro cotton pickers about the same time organized a union and at elaine many negroes who worked in the sawmills and who desired to protect their wives and daughters from insult refused to allow them to pick cotton or to work for white men at any price such was the sentiment out of which developed the progressive farmers and household union of america which was an effort by legal means to secure protection from unscrupulous landlords but which did use the form of a fraternal order with passwords and grips and insignia so as the more forcefully to appeal to some of its members about the first of october the report was spread abroad in phillips county that the negroes were plotting an insurrection and that they were rapidly preparing to massacre the white people on a great scale when the situation had become tense one sunday john clem a white man from helena drunk came to elaine and proceeded to terrorize the negro population by gun play the colored people kept off the streets in order to avoid trouble and telephoned the sheriff at helena this man failed to act the next day clem was abroad again but the negro still avoided trouble thinking that his acts were simply designed to start a race riot on tuesday evening october one however w d atkins a special agent of the missouri pacific railroad in company with charles pratt a deputy sheriff was riding past a negro church near hoop spur a small community just a few miles from elaine according to pratt persons in the church fired without cause on the party killing atkins and wounding himself according to the negroes atkins and pratt fired into the church evidently to frighten the people there assembled at any rate word spread through the county that the massacre had started and for days there was murder and rioting in the course of which not less than five white men and twenty-five negroes were killed though some estimates place the number of fatalities a great deal higher negroes were arrested and disarmed some were shot on the highways homes were fired into and at one time hundreds of men and women were in a stockade under heavy guard and under the most unwholesome conditions while hundreds of white men armed to the teeth rushed to the vicinity from neighboring cities and towns governor charles h brew telegraphed to camp pike for federal troops and five hundred were mobilized at once to repel the attack of the black army worse than any other feature was the wanton slaying of the four johnston brothers whose father had been a prominent presbyterian minister and whose mother was formerly a school-teacher dr d a e johnston was a successful dentist and owned a three-story building in helena dr lewis johnston was a physician who lived in oklahoma and who had come home on a visit a third brother had served in france and been wounded and gassed at chateau terry altogether one thousand negroes were arrested and one hundred and twenty-two indicted a special committee of seven gathered evidence and is charged with having used electric connections on the witness chair in order to frighten the negroes twelve men were sentenced to death though up to the end of nineteen twenty execution had been stayed and fifty-four to penitentiary terms the trials lasted from five to ten minutes each no witnesses for the defense were called no negroes were on the juries no change of venue was given meanwhile lawyers at helena were preparing to reap further harvest from negroes who would be indicted and against whom there was no evidence but who had saved money and liberty bonds governor brew in a statement to the press blamed the crisis and the chicago defender for the trouble 
he had served for a number of years as a professor of economics before becoming governor and had even identified himself with the forward-looking university commission on southern race questions and it is true that he postponed the executions in order to allow appeals to be filed in behalf of the condemned men but he should thus attempt to shift the burden of blame and overlook the facts when in a position of grave responsibility was a keen disappointment to the lovers of progress reference to the monthly periodical and the weekly paper just mentioned however brings us to still another matter the feeling on the part of the negro that in addition to the outrages visited on the race the government was now under the cloak of wartime legislation formally to attempt to curtail its freedom of speech for some days the issue of the crisis for may nineteen nineteen was held up in the mail a south carolina representative in congress quoted by way of denunciation from the editorial returning soldiers in the same number of the periodical and a little later in the year the department of justice devoted twenty-seven pages of the report of the investigation against persons advising anarchy sedition and the forcible overthrow of the government to a report on radicalism and sedition among the negroes as reflected in their publications among other periodicals and papers mentioned were the messenger and the negro world of new york and by the messenger indeed frankly radical in its attitude not only on the race question but also on fundamental economic principles even the crisis was regarded as conservative in tone there could be no doubt that a great spiritual change had come over the negro people of the united states at the very time that their sons and brothers were making the supreme sacrifice in france they were witnessing such events as those at east st louis or houston or reading of three burnings within a year in tennessee a new determination closely akin to consecration possessed them fully to understand the new spirit one would read not only such publications as those that have been mentioned but also those issued in the heart of the south good-bye black mammy said the southwestern christian advocate taking as its theme the story of four southern white men who acted as honorary pallbearers at an old negro woman's funeral but who under no circumstances would thus have served for a thrifty intelligent well-educated man of the race said the houston informer voicing the feeling of thousands the black man fought to make the world safe for democracy he now demands that america be made and maintained safe for black americans with hypocrisy in the practice of the christian religion there ceased to be any patience whatsoever as was shown by the treatment accorded a y m c a call on behalf of the young men and boys of the two great sister anglo-saxon nations read 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 said the challenge magazine then when the mob comes whether with torture with gun let us stand at armageddon and battle for the lord protect your home said the gentle christian recorder protect your wife and children with your life if necessary if a man crosses your threshold after you and your family the law allows you to protect your home even if you have to kill the intruder perhaps nothing however better summed up the new spirit than the following sonnet by claude mckay if we must die let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious spot while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs making their mock at our accursed lot if we must die let it not be like hogs so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honour us though dead o oh, kinsmen we must meet the common foe though far outnumbered let us still be brave and for their thousand blows deal one death-blow what though before us lies the open grave like men we'll face the murderous cowardly pack pressed to the wall dying but fighting back five the widening problem in view of the world war and the important part taken in it by french colonial troops especially those from senegal it is not surprising that the heart of the negro people in the united states broadened in a new sympathy with the problems of their brothers the world over even early in the decade that we are now considering however there was some indication of this tendency and the first universal races congress in london in nineteen eleven attracted wide attention in february nineteen nineteen 
largely through the personal effort of dr du bois a pan-african congress was held in paris the chief aims of which were the hearing of statements on the condition of negroes throughout the world the obtaining of authoritative statements of policy toward the negro race from the great powers the making of strong representations to the peace conference then sitting in paris in behalf of the negroes throughout the world and the laying down of principles on which the future development of the race must take place meanwhile the session of the virgin islands had fixed attention upon an interesting colored population at the very door of the united states and the american occupation of haiti culminating in the killing of many of the people in the course of president wilson's second administration gave a new feeling of kinship for the land of toussaint louverture among other things the evidence showed that on june twelfth nineteen eighteen under military pressure a new constitution was forced on the haitian people one favoring the white man and the foreigner that by force and brutality innocent men and women including native preachers and members of their churches had been taken roped together and marched as slave gangs to prison and that in large numbers haitians had been taken from their homes and farms and made to work on new roads for twenty cents a week without being properly furnished with food all of this being done under the pretense of improving the social and political condition of the country the whole world now realized that the negro problem was no longer local in the united states or south africa or the west indies but international in its scope and possibilities very early in the course of the conflict in europe it was pointed out that africa was the real prize of the war and it is now simply a commonplace to say that the bases of the struggle were economic nothing did germany regret more than the forcible seizure of her african possessions one cannot fail to observe moreover a tendency of discussion of problems resultant from the war to shift the consideration from that of pure politics to that of racial relations and early in the conflict students of society the world over realized that it was nothing less than suicide on the part of the white race after the close of the war many books dealing with the issues at stake were written and in the year nineteen twenty alone several of these appeared in the united states of all these publications because of their different points of view four might call for special consideration the republic of liberia by r c f Malm, the rising tide of color by lothrop stoddard dark water by w e burkhardt du bois and empire and commerce in africa a study in economic imperialism by leonard wolfe the position of each of these books is clear and all bear directly upon the central theme the republic of liberia was written by one who some years ago was the english consul at monrovia and who afterwards was appointed to dakar the supplementary preface also gives the information that the book was really written two years before it appeared publication being delayed on account of the difficulties of printing at the time even up to nineteen eighteen however the account is incomplete and the failure to touch upon recent developments becomes serious but it is of course impossible to record the history of liberia from eighteen forty seven to the present and reflect credit upon england there are some pages of value in the book especially those in which the author speaks of the labor situation in the little african republic but these are obviously intended primarily for consumption by business men in london liberians we are informed tell you that whatever may be said to the contrary the republic's most uncomfortable neighbor has always been france this is hardly true france has indeed on more than one occasion tried to equal her great rival in aggrandizement but she has never quite succeeded in so doing as we have already shown in connection with liberia in the present work from the very first the shadow of great britain fell across the country in more recent years by loans that were no more than clever plans for thievery by the forceful occupation of large tracts of land and by interference in the internal affairs of the country england has again and again proved herself the arch enemy of the republic the book so recently written in the last analysis appears to be little more than the basis of effort towards still further exploitation the very merit of the rising tide of color depends on its bias and it is significant that the book closes with a quotation from kipling's the heritage 
to dr stoddard the most disquieting feature of the recent situation was not the war but the peace says he the white world's inability to frame a constructive settlement the perpetuation of intestine hatreds and the menace of fresh civil wars complicated by the specter of social revolution evoke the dread thought that the late war may be merely the first stage in a cycle of ruin as for the war itself as colored men realized the significance of it all they looked into each other's eyes and there saw the light of undreamed of hopes the white world was tearing itself to pieces white solidarity was riven and shattered and fear of white power and respect for white civilization together dropped away like garments outworn through the bazaars of asia ran the sibilant whisper the east will see the west to bed at last comes the inevitable conclusion pleading for a better understanding between england and germany and for everything else that would make for racial solidarity the pitiful thing about this book is that it is so thoroughly representative of the thing for which it pleads it is the very essence of jingoism civilization does not exist in and of itself it is white and the conclusions are directly at variance with the ideals that have been supposed to guide england and america incidentally the work speaks of the negro and negroid population of africa as estimated at about one hundred and twenty million this low estimate has proved a common pitfall for writers if we remember that africa is three and a half times as large as the united states and that while there are no cities as large as new york and chicago there are many centers of very dense population if we omit entirely from the consideration the desert of sahara and make due allowance for some heavily wooded tracts in which live no people at all and if we then take some fairly well-known regions like nigeria or sierra leone as the basis of estimate we shall arrive at some such figure as four hundred and fifty million in order to satisfy any other points that might possibly be made let us reduce this by as much as a third and we shall still have three hundred million which figure we feel justified in advancing as the lowest possible estimate for the population of africa and yet most books tell us that there are only one hundred and forty billion people on the whole continent dark water may be regarded as the reply to such a position as that taken by dr stoddard if the white world conceives it to be its destiny to exploit the darker races of mankind then it simply remains for the darker races to gird their loins for the contest what of the darker world that watches most men belong to this world with negro and negroid east indian chinese and japanese they form two-thirds of the population of the world a belief in humanity is a belief in colored men if the uplift of mankind must be done by men then the destinies of this world will rest ultimately in the hands of darker nations what then is this dark world thinking it is thinking that as wild and awful as this shameful war was it is nothing to compare with that fight for freedom which black and brown and yellow men must and will make unless their oppression and humiliation and insult at the hands of the white world cease the dark world is going to submit to its present treatment just as long as it must and not one moment longer both of these books are strong and both are materialistic and materialism it must be granted is a very important factor in the world just now somewhat different in outlook however is the book that labors under an economic subject empire and commerce in africa in general the inquiry is concerned with the question what do we desire to attain particularly economically in africa and how far is it attainable through policy the discussion is mainly confined to the three powers england france and germany and special merit attaches to the chapter on abyssinia probably the best brief account of this country ever written mr wolf announces such fundamental principles as that the land in africa should be reserved for the natives that there should be systematic education of the natives with a view of tra training them to take part in and eventually control the government of the country that there should be a gradual expatriation of all europeans and their capitalistic enterprises that all revenue raised in africa should be applied to the development of the country and the education and health of its inhabitants that alcohol should be absolutely prohibited and that africa should be completely neutralized that is in no case should any military operations between european states be allowed the difficulties of the enforcement of such a program are of course apparent to the author but with other such volumes as this to guide and mould opinion the time may indeed come at no distant date when africa will cease to exist solely for exploitation and no longer be the rebuke of christendom these four books then express fairly well the different opinions and hopes with which africa and the world problem that the continent raises have recently been regarded 
it remains simply to mention a conception that after the close of the war found many adherents in the united states and elsewhere and whose operation was on a scale that forced recognition this was the idea of the provisional republic of africa the universal negro improvement association and african communities league of the world the black star line of steamships and the negro factories corporation all of which activities were centered in new york had as their organ the negro world and as their president and leading spirit marcus garvey who was originally from jamaica the central thought that appealed to great crowds of people and won their support was that of freedom for the race in every sense of the word such freedom it was declared transcended the mere demand for the enforcement of certain political and social rights and could finally be realized only under a vast super-government guiding the destinies of the race in africa the united states the west indies and everywhere else in the world this was to control its people just as the pope and the catholic church control its millions in every land their related ideas and activities were sometimes termed grandiose and they awakened such opposition on the part of the old leaders the clergy while conservative business stood aloof at the same time the conception is one that deserves to be considered on its merits it is quite possible that if promoted on a scale vast enough such a negro supergovernment as that proposed could be realized it is true that england and france seem to-day to have a firm grip on the continent of africa but the experience of germany has shown that even the mailed fist may lose its strength overnight with england beset with problems in ireland and the west indies in india and egypt it is easy for the millions in equatorial africa to be made to know that even this great power is not invincible and in time might rest with nineveh and tyre there are things in africa that will forever baffle all europeans and no foreign governor will ever know all that is at the back of the black man's mind even now without the aid of modern science information travels in a few hours throughout the length and breadth of the continent and those that slept are beginning to be awake and restless let this restlessness increase let intelligence also increase let the natives be aided by their fever and all the armies of europe could be lost in africa and this ancient mother still rise bloody but unbowed the realization of the vision however would call for capital on a scale as vast as that of a modern war or an international industrial enterprise at the very outset it would engage england in nothing less than a death grapple especially as regards the shipping on the west coast if ships cannot go from liverpool to secondi and lagos then england herself is doomed the possible contest appalls the imagination at the same time the exploiting that now goes on in the world cannot go on for ever end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen the negro problem it is probably clear from our study in the preceding pages that the history of the negro people in the united states falls into well-defined periods or epochs first of all there was the colonial era extending from the time of the first coming of negroes to the english colonies to that of the revolutionary war this divides into two parts with a line coming at the year seventeen o five before this date the exact status of the negro was more or less undefined the system of servitude was only gradually passing into the sterner one of slavery and especially in the middle colonies there was considerable intermixture of the races by the year seventeen o five however it had become generally established that the negro was to be regarded not as a person but as a thing and the next seventy years were a time of increasing numbers but of no racial coherence or spiritual outlook only a spasmodic insurrection here and there indicating the yearning for a better day with the revolution there came a change and the second period extends from this war to the civil war this also divides into two parts with a line 
at the year eighteen thirty in the years immediately succeeding the revolution there was put forth the first effective effort toward racial organization this being represented by the work of such men as richard allen and prince hall but in spite of a new racial consciousness the great mass of the negro people remained in much the same situation as before the increase in numbers incident to the invention of the cotton gin only intensifying the ultimate problem about the year eighteen thirty however the very hatred and ignominy that began to be visited upon the negro indicated that at least he was no longer a thing but a person lynching began to grow apace burlesque on the stage tended to depreciate and humiliate the race and the south became definitely united in its defense of the system of slavery on the other hand the abolitionists challenged the attitude that was becoming popular the negroes themselves began to be prosperous and to hold conventions and nat turner's insurrection thrust baldly before the american people the great moral and economic problem with which they had to deal with such divergent opinions in spite of feeble attempts at compromise there could be no peace until the issue of slavery at least was definitely settled the third great period extends from the civil war to the opening of the great war in europe like the others it also falls into two parts the division coming at the year eighteen ninety five the thirty years from eighteen sixty five to eighteen ninety five may be regarded as an era in which the race now emancipated was mainly under the guidance of political ideals several men went to congress and popular education began to be emphasized but the difficulties of reconstruction and the outrages of the ku klux klan were succeeded by an enveloping system of peonage and by eighteen ninety to eighteen ninety five the pendulum had swung fully backward and in the south disfranchisement had been arrived at as the concrete solution of the political phase of the problem the twenty years from eighteen ninety five to nineteen fifteen formed a period of unrest and violence but also of solid economic and social progress the dominant influence being the work of booker t washington with the world war the negro people came face to face with new and vast problems of economic adjustment and passed into an entirely different period of their racial history in america this is not all however the race is not to be regarded simply as existent unto itself the most casual glance at any such account as we have given emphasizes the importance of the negro in the general history of the united states other races have come sometimes with great gifts or in great numbers but it is upon this one that the country's history is turned as on a pivot it is true that it has been despised and rejected but more and more it seems destined to give new proof that the stone which the builders refused has become the head stone of the corner in the colonial era it was the economic advantage of slavery over servitude that caused it to displace this institution as a system of labor in the preliminary draft of the declaration of independence a noteworthy passage arraigned the king of england for his insistence upon the slave trade but this was later suppressed for reasons of policy the war itself revealed clearly the fallacy of the position of the patriots who fought for their rights as englishmen but not for the fundamental rights of man and their attitude received formal expression in the compromises that entered into the constitution the expansion of the southwest depended on the labor of the negro whose history became inextricably bound up with that of the cotton gin and the question or the excuse of fugitives was the real key to the seminole wars the long struggle culminating in the civil war was simply to settle the status of the negro in the republic and the legislation after the war determined for a generation the history not only of the south but very largely of the nation as well the later disfranchising acts have had overwhelming importance 
the unfair system of national representation controlling the election of nineteen sixteen and thus the attitude of america in the world war this is an astonishing phenomenon this vast influence of a people oppressed proscribed and scorned the negro is so dominant in american history not only because he tests the real meaning of democracy not only because he challenges the conscience of the nation but also because he calls in question one's final attitude toward human nature itself as we have seen it is not necessarily the worker not even the criminal who makes the ultimate problem but the simple negro of whatever quality if this man did not have to work at all and if his race did not include a single criminal in american opinion he would still raise the question it is accordingly from the social standpoint that we must finally consider the problem before we can do this we need to study the race as an actual living factor in american life and even before we do that it might be in order to observe the general importance of the negro today in any discussion of the racial problems of the world one world aspect any consideration of the negro problem in its world aspect at the present time must necessarily be very largely concerned with africa as the centre of the negro population this in turn directs attention to the great colonizing powers of europe and especially to great britain as the chief of these and the questions that result are of far-reaching importance for the whole fabric of modern civilization no one can gainsay the tremendous contribution that england has made to the world every one must respect a nation that produced wycliffe and shakespeare and darwin and that standing for democratic principles has so often stayed the tide of absolutism and anarchy and it is not without desert that for three hundred years this country has held the moral leadership of mankind it may now not unreasonably be asked however if it has not lost some of its old ideals and if further insistence upon some of its policies would not constitute a menace to all that the heart of humanity holds dear as a preliminary to our discussion let us remark two men by way of contrast a little more than seventy years ago a great traveller set out upon the first of three long journeys through central and southern africa he was a renowned explorer and yet to him the end of the geographical feat was only the beginning of the enterprise said henry drummond of him wherever david livingstone's footsteps are crossed in africa the fragrance of his memory seems to remain on one occasion a hunter was impaled on the horn of a rhinoceros and a messenger ran eight miles for the physician although he himself had been wounded for life by a lion and his friends said that he should not ride at night through a wood infested with beasts livingstone insisted on his christian duty to go only to find that the man had died and to be obliged to retrace his footsteps again and again his party would have been destroyed if it had not been for his own unbounded tact and courage and after his death at chitambo's village susi and chuma journeyed for nine months and over eight hundred miles to take his body to the coast we work for a glorious future said he which we are not destined to see the golden age which has not been but will yet be we are only morning stars shining in the dark but the glorious morn will break the good time coming yet for this time we work may god accept our imperfect service about the time that livingstone was passing off the scene another strong man one of england's empire builders began his famous career going first to south africa as a young man in quest of health cecil rhodes soon made a huge fortune out of kimberley diamonds and transvaal gold and by eighteen ninety had become the prime minister of cape colony in the pursuit of his aims he was absolutely unscrupulous he refused to recognize any rights of the portuguese in matabaland and mashonaland he drove hard bargains with the germans and the french he defied the boers and to him the native africans were simply so many tools for the heaping up of gold nobody ever said of him that he left a fragrant memory behind him but thousands of bruised bodies and broken hearts bore witness to his policy according to the ideals of modern england however he was a great man what the negro in the last analysis wonders is who was right livingstone or rhodes and which is the world to choose christ or mammon
there are two fundamental assumptions upon which all so-called western civilization is based that of racial and that of religious superiority sight has been lost of the fact that there is really no such thing as a superior race that only individuals are superior one to another and a popular english poet has sung of the white man's burden and of lesser breeds without the law these two assumptions have accounted for all of the misunderstanding that has arisen between the west and the east for china and japan india and egypt cannot see by what divine right men from the west suppose that they have the only correct ancestry or by what conceit they presume to have a, the only true faith let them but be accepted however let a nation be led by them as guiding stars and england becomes justified in forcing her system upon india she finds it necessary to send missionaries to japan and the lion's paw pounces upon the very islands of the sea the whole world however is now rising as never before against any semblance of selfishness on the part of great powers and it is more than ever clear that before there can be any genuine progress toward the brotherhood of man or toward comity among nations one man will have to give some consideration to the other man's point of view one people will have to respect another people's tradition the russo-japanese war gave men a new vision the whole world gazed upon a new power in the east one that could be dealt with only upon equal terms meanwhile there was unrest in india and in africa there were insurrections of increasing bitterness and fierceness africa especially had been misrepresented the people were all said to be savages and cannibals almost hopelessly degraded the traders and the politicians knew better they knew that there were tribes and tribes in africa that many of the chiefs were upright and wise and proud of their tradition and that the land could not be seized any too quickly hence they made haste to get into the game it is increasingly evident also that the real leadership of the world is a matter not of race not even of professed religion but of principle within the last hundred years as science has flourished and colonization grown we have been led astray by materialism the worship of the dollar has become a fetish and the man or the nation that had the money felt that it was ordained of god to rule the universe germany was led astray by this belief but it is england not germany that has most thoroughly mastered the art of colonization crown colonies are to be operated in the interest of the owners jingoism is king it matters not that the people in india and africa in haiti and the philippines object to our benevolence we know what is good for them and therefore they should be satisfied in jamaica to-day the poorer people cannot get employment and yet rather than accept the supply at hand the powers of privilege import coolie labor a still cheaper supply in sierra leone where certainly there has been time to see the working of the principal native young men crowd about the wharves and seize any chance to earn a penny simply because there is no work at hand to do nothing that would genuinely nourish independence and self-respect it is not strange that the worship of industrialism with its attendant competition finally brought about the most disastrous war in history and such a breakdown of all principles of morality has made the world stand aghast womanhood was no longer sacred old ideas of ethics vanished christ himself was crucified again everything holy and lovely was given to the grasping demon of wealth suddenly men realized that england had lost the moral leadership of the world lured by the ideals of rhodes the country that gave to mankind magna carta seemed now bent only on its own aggrandizement and preservation germany's colonies were seized and anything that threatened the permanence of the dominant system especially unrest on the part of the native african was throttled britain and boer began to feel an identity of interest and especially was it made known that american negroes were not wanted just what the situation is to-day may be illustrated by the simple matter of foreign missions the policy of missionary organizations in both england and america being dictated by the political policy of the empire the appointing of negroes by the great american denominations for service in africa has practically ceased for american negroes are not to be admitted to any portion of the continent except liberia which after all is a very small part of the whole for the time being the little republic seems to receive countenance from the great powers as a sort of safety valve through which the aspiration of the negro people might spend itself but it is evident that the present understanding is purely artificial and can not last even the roman empire declined and germany lost her hold in africa overnight 
of course it may be contended that the british empire to-day is not decadent but stronger than ever at the same time there can be no doubt that englishmen and boer alike regard these teeming millions of prolific black people always with concern and sometimes with dismay natives of the congo still bear the marks of mutilation and men in south africa chafe under unjust land acts and constant indignities in their daily life here rises the question for our own country to the united states at last has come that moral leadership that obligation to do the right thing that opportunity to exhibit the highest honor in all affairs foreign or domestic that is the ultimate test of greatness it is america to view this great problem in africa sympathetically and find some place for the groping for freedom of millions of human beings or is she to be simply a pawn in the game of english colonization is she to abide by the principles that guided her in seventeen seventy six or simply seize her share of the booty the negro either at home or abroad is only one of many moral problems with which he has to deal at the close of the war extravagance reigned crime was rampant and against any one of three or four races there was insidious propaganda to add to the difficulties the government was still so dominated by politics and officialdom that it was almost always impossible to get things done at the time they needed to be done at the same time every patriot knows that america is truly the hope of the world into her civilization and her glory have entered not one but many races all go forth against a common enemy all should share the duties and the privileges of citizenship in such a country the law can know no difference of race or class or creed provided all are devoted to the general welfare such is the obligation resting upon the united states such the challenge of social economic and moral questions such as never before faced the children of men that she be worthy of her opportunity all would pray to the fulfilment of her destiny all should help the eyes of the world are upon her the sceptre of the ages is in her hand to the negro in american life if now we come to the negro in the united states it is hardly an exaggeration to say that no other race than the american body politic not even the anglo-saxon has been studied more critically than this one and treatment has varied all the way from the celebration of virtues to the bitterest hostility and malignity it is clearly fundamentally necessary to pay some attention to racial characteristics and gifts in recent years there has been much discussion from the standpoint of biology and special emphasis has been placed on the emotional temperament of the race the negro however submits that in the united states he has not been chiefly responsible for such miscegenation as has taken place but he is not content to rest simply upon a ad to corquet he calls attention to the fact that whereas it has been charged that lynchings find their excuse in rape it has been shown again and again that this crime is the excuse for only one-fourth or one-fifth of the cases of violence if for the moment we suppose that there is no question about guilt in a fourth or, or fifth of the cases the overwhelming fraction that remains indicates that there are other factors of the highest importance that have to be considered in any ultimate adjustment of the situation in every case accordingly the negro asks only for a fair trial in court not too hurried and he knows that in many instances a calm study of the facts will reveal nothing more than fright or hysteria on the part of a woman or even other circumstances not more incriminating unfortunately the whole question of the negro has been beclouded by misrepresentation as has no other social question before the american people and the race asks simply first of all that the tissue of depreciation raised by prejudice be done away with in order that it may be judged and estimated for its quality america can make no charges against any element of her population while she denies the fundamental right of citizenships the protection of the individual person too often mistakes are made and no man is so humble or so low that he should be deprived of his life without due process of law the negro undoubtedly has faults at the same time in order that his gifts may receive just consideration the tradition of burlesque must for the time being be forgotten all stories about razors chickens and watermelons must be relegated to the rear and even the revered and beloved black mammy must receive an affectionate but a long farewell 
the fact is that the negro has such a contagious brand of humor that many people never realize that this plays only on the surface the real background of the race is one of tragedy it is not in current jest but in the wail of the old melodies that the soul of this people is found there is something elemental about the heart of the race something that finds its origin in the forest and in the falling of the stars there is something grim about it too something that speaks of the lash of the child torn from his mother's bosom of the dead body swinging at night by the roadside the race has suffered and in its suffering lies its destiny and its contribution to america and hereby hangs a tale if we study the real quality of the negro we shall find that two things are observable one is that any distinction so far won by a member of the race in america has been almost always in some one of the arts and the other is that any influence so far exerted by the negro on american civilization has been primarily in the field of aesthetics the reason is not far to seek and is to be found in the artistic striving even of untutored negroes the instinct for beauty insists upon an outlet and if one can find no better picture he will paste a circus poster or a flaring advertisement on the wall very few homes have not at least a geranium on the window-sill or a rose-bush in the garden if we look at the matter conversely we shall find that those things which are most picturesque make to the negro the readiest appeal red is his favorite color simply because it is the most pronounced of all colors the principle holds in the sphere of religion in some of our communities negroes are known to get happy in church it is however seldom a sermon on the rule of faith or the plan of salvation that awakens such ecstasy but rather a vivid portrayal of the beauties of heaven with the walls of jasper the feast of milk and honey and the angels with palms in their hands the appeal is primarily sensuous and it is hardly too much to say that the negro is thrilled not so much by the moral as by the artistic and pictorial elements in religion every member of the race is an incipient poet and all are enthralled by music and oratory illustrations are abundant we might refer to the oratory of douglas to the poetry of dunbar to the picturesque style of du bois to the mysticism of the paintings of tanner to the tragic sculpture of meta warwick fuller and to a long line of singers and musicians even booker washington most practical of americans proves the point the distinguishing qualities of his speeches being anecdote and vivid illustration it is best however to consider members of the race who were entirely untaught in the schools on one occasion harriet tubman famous for her work in the underground railroad was addressing an audience and describing a great battle in the civil war and then said she we saw the lightning and that was the guns and then we heard the thunder and that was the big guns and then we heard the rain falling and that was drops of blood falling and when we came to get in the craps it was dead men that we reaped two decades after the war john jasper of richmond virginia astonished the most intelligent hearers by the power of his imagery he preached not only that the sun do move but also of dry bones in the valley the glories of the new jerusalem and on many similar subjects that have been used by other preachers sometimes with hardly less effect throughout the south in his own way jasper was an artist he was eminently imaginative and it is with this imaginative this artistic quality that america has yet to reckon the importance of the influence has begun to be recognized and on the principle that to him that hath shall be given in increasing measure the negro is being blamed for the ills of american life a ready excuse being found in the perversion and debasement of negro music we have seen discussions whose reasoning condensed was somewhat as follows the negro element is daily becoming more potent in american society american society is daily becoming more immoral therefore at the door of the negro may be laid the increase in divorce and all the other evils of society the most serious charge brought against the negro intellectually is that he has not yet developed the great creative or organizing mind that points the way of civilization he most certainly has not and in this he is not very unlike all the other people in america the whole country is still in only the earlier years of its striving while the united states has made great advance in applied science she has as yet produced no shakespeare or beethoven if america has not yet reached her height after three hundred years of striving she ought not to be impatient with the negro after only sixty years of opportunity but all signs go to prove the assumption of limited intellectual ability fundamentally false already some of the younger men of the race have given the highest possible promise if all of this however is granted and if the negro's exemplification 
of the principle of self-help that is also recognized the question still remains just what is the race worth as a constructive factor in american civilization is it finally to be an agency for the upbuilding of the nation or simply one of the forces that retard what is its real promise in american life in reply to this it might be worth while to consider first of all the country's industrial life the south and very largely the whole country depends upon negro men and women as the stable labor supply in such occupations as farming sawmilling mining cooking and washing all of this is hard work and necessary work in nineteen ten of three million one hundred and seventy eight thousand five hundred and fifty four negro men at work nine hundred and eighty one thousand nine hundred and twenty two were listed as farm laborers and seven hundred and ninety eight thousand five hundred and nine as farmers that is to say fifty six per cent of the whole number were engaged in raising farm products either on their own account or by way of assisting somebody else and the great staples of course were the cotton and corn of the southern states if along with the farmers we take those engaged in the occupations employing the next greatest numbers of men those of the building and hand trades saw and planing mills as well as those of railway firemen and porters draymen teamsters and coal mine operatives we shall find a total of seventy one point two per cent engaged in such work as represents the very foundation of american industry of the women at work one million forty seven thousand one hundred and forty six or fifty two per cent were either farm laborers or farmers and twenty eight per cent more were either cooks or washerwomen in other words a total of exactly eighty per cent were engaged in some of the hardest and at the same time some of the most vital labor in our home and industrial life the new emphasis on the negro as an industrial factor in the course of the recent war is well known when immigration ceased upon its shoulders very largely fell the task of keeping the country and the army alive since the war closed he has been on the defensive in the north but a country that wishes to consider all of the factors that enter into its gravest social problem could never forget his valiant service in nineteen eighteen let any one ask moreover even the most prejudiced observer if he would like to see every negro in the country out of it and he will then decide whether economically the negro is a liability or an asset again consider the negro soldier in all our history there are no pages more heroic more pathetic than those detailing the exploits of black men we remember the negro three thousand strong fighting for the liberties of america when his own race was still held in bondage we remember the deeds at port hudson fort pillow and fort wagner we remember santiago and san juan hill not only how negro men went gallantly to the charge but how a black regiment faced pestilence that the ranks of their white comrades might not be decimated and then carazal once more at an unexpected moment the heart of the nation was thrilled by the troopers of the tenth cavalry once more despite brownsville the tradition of fort wagner was preserved and passed on and then came the greatest of all wars again was the negro summoned to the colors summoned out of all proportion to his numbers others might desert but not he others might be spies or strikers but not he not he in the time of peril in peace or war in victory or danger he has always been loyal to the stars and stripes not only however does the negro give promise by reason of his economic worth not only does he deserve the fullest rights of citizenship on the basis of his work as a soldier he brings nothing less than a great spiritual contribution to civilization in america his is a race of enthusiasm imagination and spiritual fervor and after all the doubt and fear through which it has passed there still rests with it an abiding faith in god around us everywhere our commercialism politics graft sordidness selfishness cynicism we need hope and love a new birth of idealism a new faith in the unseen already the work of some members of the race has pointed the way to great things in the realm of conscious art but above even art soars the great world of the spirit this it is that america most sadly needs this it is that her most fiercely persecuted children bring to her obviously now if the negro if any race is to make to america the contribution of which it is capable it must be free and this raises the whole question of relation to the rest of the body politic one of the interesting phenomena of society in america is that the more foreign elements enter into the melting pot and advance in culture the more do they cling to their racial identity incorporation into american life instead of making the greek or the pole or the irishman forget his native country makes him all the more jealous of its traditions the more a centre of any one of these nationalities develops the more wealthy and cultured its members become 
the more do we find them proud of the source from which they sprang the irishman is now so much an american that he controls whole wards in our large cities and sometimes the cities themselves all the same he clings more tenaciously than ever to the celebration of march seventeen when an isolated greek came years ago poor and friendless nobody thought very much about him and he effaced himself as much as possible taking advantage however of any opportunity that offered for self-improvement or economic advance when thousands came and the newcomers could take inspiration from those of their brothers who had preceded them and achieved success nationality asserted itself larger groups now talked about venizelos and a greater greece their chests expanded at the thought of marathon and plato and companies paraded amid applause as they went to fight in the balkans in every case with increasing intelligence and wealth race pride asserted itself at the same time no one would think of denying to the greek or the irishman or the italian his full rights as an american citizen it is a paradox indeed this thing of a race as holding its identity at the same time that it is supposed to lose this in the larger civilization apply the principle to the negro very soon after the civil war when conditions were chaotic and ignorance was rampant the ideals constantly held before the race were those of white people some leaders indeed measured success primarily by the extent to which they became merged in the white man's life at the time this was very natural a struggling people wished to show that it could be judged by the standards of the highest civilization within sight and it did so to-day the tide has changed the race now numbers a few millionaires in almost every city there are beautiful homes owned by negroes some men have reached high attainment in scholarship and the promise grows greater and greater in art and science accordingly the negro now loves his own cherishes his own teaches his boys about black heroes and honors and glorifies his own black women schools and churches and all sorts of cooperative enterprises testify to the new racial self-respect while a genuine negro drama has begun to flourish a whole people has been reborn a whole race has found its soul three face to face even when all that has been said is granted it is still sometimes maintained that the negro is the one race that cannot and will not be permitted to enter into the full promise of american life other elements it is said even if difficult to assimilate may gradually be brought into the body politic but the negro is the one element that may be tolerated but not assimilated utilized but not welcome to the fullness of the country's glory however the negro has no reason to be discouraged if one will but remember that after all slavery was but an incident and recall the status of the negro even in the free states ten years before the civil war he will be able to see a steady line of progress forward after the great moral and economic awakening that gave the race its freedom the pendulum swung backward and finally reached its farthest point of proscription of lawlessness and inhumanity no obscuring of the vision for the time being should blind us to the reading of the great movement of history to-day in the whole question of the negro problem there are some matters of pressing and general importance one that is constantly thrust forward is that of the negro criminal on this the answer is clear if a man negro or otherwise is a criminal he is an enemy of society and society demands that he be placed where he will do the least harm if execution is necessary this should take place in private and in no case should the criminal be so handled as to corrupt the morals or arouse the morbid sensibilities of the populace at the same time simple patriotism would demand that by uplifting home surroundings good schools and wholesome recreation everything possible be done for negro children as for other children of the republic so that just as few of them as possible may graduate into the criminal class another matter closely akin to this is that of the astonishing lust for torture that more and more is actuating the american people when in eighteen thirty five mackintosh was burned in st louis for the murder of an officer the american people stood aghast and abraham lincoln just coming into local prominence spoke as if the very foundations of the young republic had been shaken after the civil war however horrible lynchings became frequent and within the last decade we have seen a negro boy stabbed in numberless places while on his way to the stake we have seen the eyes of a negro man burned out with hot irons and pieces of his flesh cut off and a negro woman whose only offence was a word of protest against the lynching of her husband while in the state of advanced pregnancy hanged head downwards her clothing burned from her body and herself so disemboweled that her unborn babe fell to the ground we submit that any citizens who commit such deeds as these are deserving of the most serious concern of their country 
and when they bring their little children to behold their acts when baby fingers handle mutilated flesh and baby eyes behold such pictures as we have suggested a crime has been committed against the very name of childhood most frequently it will be found that the men who do these things have had only the most meagre educational advantages and that generally but not always they live in remote communities away from centres of enlightenment so that their whole course of life is such as to cultivate provincialism with not the slightest touch of irony whatever we suggest that these men need a crusade of education in books and in the fundamental obligations of citizenship at present their ignorance their prejudice and their lack of moral sense constitute a national menace it is full time to pause we have already gone too far the negro problem is only an index to the ills of society in america in our haste to get rich or to meet new conditions we are in danger of losing all of our old standards of conduct of training and of morality our courts need to summon a new respect for themselves the average citizen knows only this about them that he wants to keep away from them so far we have not been assured of justice the poor man has not stood an equal chance with the rich nor the black with the white money has been freely used even for the changing of laws if need be and the sentencing of a man of means generally means only that he will have a new trial the murders in any american city average each year fifteen or twenty times as many as in an english or french city of the same size our churches need a new baptism they have lost the faith the same principle applies in our home life in education and literature the family altar is almost extinct learning is more easy than sound and in literature as in other forms of art any passing fad is able to gain followers and pose as worthy achievement all along the line we need more uprightness more strength even when a man has committed a crime he must receive justice in court within recent years we have heard too much about speedy trials which are often nothing more than legalized lynchings if it has been decreed that a man is to wait for a trial one week or one year the mob has nothing to do with the matter and if need be all the soldiery of the united states must be called forth to prevent the storming of a jail fortunately the last few years have shown us several sheriffs who had this conception of their duty in the last analysis this may mean that more responsibility and more force will have to be lodged in the federal government within recent years the dignity of the united states has been seriously impaired the time seems now to have come when the government must make a new assertion of its integrity and its authority no power in the country can be stronger than that of the united states of america for the time being then this is what we need a stern adherence to law if men will not be good they must at least be made to behave no one will pretend however that an adjustment on such a basis is finally satisfactory above the law of the state above all law of man is the law of god it was given at sinai thousands of years ago it received new meaning at calvary to wit we must all yet come the way may be hard and in the strife of the present the time may seem far distant but some day the messiah will reign and man to man the world over shall brothers be for all that end of section twenty eight end of a social history of the american negro by benjamin griffith brawley